Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, Dare County Board of Commissioners June the 20th meeting. Um, at this time, we were supposed to have uh, Reverend Nick Hodgson to do an invocation. Is Reverend Hodgson in the audience? Don't see him. Okay, I'm going to ask Commissioner Couch if he'll lead us in an invocation. Bow our heads and seek the peace and unity. Gracious, loving creator, we are grateful to be here in your name, here in your honor. We ask that you bless this gathering today, that you continue to inspire us with all the things we do to help our fellow human beings, to help those who need help, and just Heavenly Father, to make sure we continue this to be the goodliest land under the cope of heaven. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Commissioner Couch. May we stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag. County manager. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Item one on the agenda is the chairman's opening remarks. Okay, thank you, county manager. We, I've just got uh, three items I'd like to uh, cover with the uh, group this evening. Um, at um, a special meeting that uh, we held on the 15th of this month, <laughs> um, the board voted unanimously to um, uh, work with uh, Woda Cooper on the housing project for Bowser Town and a site in Nags Head. And so um, we, look, um, we look forward to um, that coming to fruition uh, within the county. We're looking at a approximately a total of both of those combined of about a hundred units. So um, it's nowhere, no, no, where no means as to um, uh, uh, solving the essential and workforce housing issues in Dare County, but it certainly is a step in the right direction. Um, most of you are aware that this board spends about 250, we set aside $250,000 a year for the DARE Guarantee Scholarship Fund. And that is going extremely well for us in this beautiful campus here in Manio. I'd like to um, at least um, recognize uh, the Out of Banks Community Foundation for their efforts uh, recently they uh, are working uh, in addition to what we're doing for our graduating seniors at our three high schools in Dale <laughs> County. They awarded recently $191,000, uh, some 76 scholarships were, were awarded to 56 <laughs> students um, this, this past spring including renewable scholarships. Some of this is renewable scholarships for second, third, and four-year college students. Uh, the Community Foundation's Growing Scholarship Program um, provides support and encouragement each year to our community's future leaders, uh, skilled workers, artists, and professionals. 38% of the graduating seniors receiving community foundation scholarships will be the first in their families to ever attend college. That's pretty, pretty high percentage. In addition, three newly established scholarship programs have awarded their first scholarships to students who have completed two years of coursework at COA. Um, and some of those students, the majority of those students, took advantage of the DARE Guarantee Scholarship Fund. So CO, uh, Community Foundation's working very, very diligently to help students that receive associate's degree from COA to help them continue their education to move forward to get a 
actual four year degree. So hats off to uh, uh, the community foundation for the amount of money that, that they're spending. Um, I serve as a trustee on the uh, their, uh, uh, on the COA Board of Trustees. Uh, just recently, last week, at one of our trustee meetings, um, the college is announcing uh, an expansion of the health science and uh, simulation lab at our campus in Elizabeth City. Uh, why, oh, why are they doing this? This is really, really exciting and encouraging that the COA facility and staff um, have, agreed, have uh, a great deal to be um, certainly proud of, and they've done so with increasingly outdated facilities. Uh, the Owens Center, uh, constructed almost 20 years ago, was originally designed to serve 170 students. It's currently serving 220 to 253 students with two programs housed in, uh, in other buildings. So the North Carolina Board of Nursing passed a new requirement in 2007. Nursing education programs shall provide a stimulus environment with adequate facilities. COA's nursing program and facilities are so strong, <laughs> number one in the state, as a matter of fact, that they've got to um, expand this facility. And um, they, they're they now uh, pushing for a $25 million uh, program that will, will expand these facilities on the campus of COA. So um, great things happening at COA and um, could not be uh, more proud of certainly what um, the Board of Trustees um, have agreed to try to help um, uh, move this uh, number one nursing program along in, in all of uh, the state of North Carolina. So um, with that being said, I do have one more uh, uh, thing I'd like to uh, do this evening before uh, we turn it over to public comment. And that is, um, as chairman of the Dare County Board of Commissioners, it's certainly my uh, pleasure and my honor to present the 2022 Dare County Citizen of the Year Award to someone who could, couldn't be more deserving of this recognition. This was a unanimous, when I, we do this annually, reached out to the board as to who they felt was deserving of this. Every single board member, <laughs> this name came up as soon as I approached them. And, and ask them for input, uh, this individual's um, name came up. Uh, he's a beacon of hope and, and helping hands for people on Hatteras Island. Over the years, uh, he has served in many different volunteer capacities, but most notable is his leadership role as president of the Cape Hatteras United Methodist Men. I'm referring to Dennis Carroll. Dennis, would you join me uh, down front, please? God bless you for what you do. This kind of worked out. Um, uh, many of uh, their days, we always do this Saturday morning, and uh, we weren't able to do it this year. As a result of that, we had to make it this evening, and Dennis has got more of his family here, would have been here tonight as opposed to during their days. So, and I'm hoping this. Hey, uh they're here to help embarrass me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say this. For those of you unfamiliar with Cape Hatteras United Methodist Men's, and I, 
I don't know how many of you would not be aware of what they do. Uh, just let me share. Let me share some information. Um, they were founded in 1978, 44 years, right, Dennis? Amazing group of men and women. Um, they have fed over 19,000 people, and they've spent over $2 million. And let me tell you what they spent $2 million on. This is what they fixed. They fixed damaged roofs. They've replaced siding on homes. They've repaired flood damaged floors. Uh, they've eradicated mold in homes. Uh, they've built wheelchair ramps. They've replaced insulation. Uh, they buy, they've bought medicine for some of the folks down there. They help fund emergency medical and dental care for some of the folks down there. Or they simply keep the lights and heat on for those that are in need on Hatteras Island. These estimates certainly don't include hundreds of thousands of hours, don't include just money, but hundreds of thousands of hours of dedicated volunteer service. As a leader, Dennis, as a leader, of Cape Hatteras uh, United Methodist Men. He's known for his kindness, his compassion, and his willingness and ability to put himself in a position of others to find solutions for struggling people who face these obstacles in life. He's also known for his professionalism, his, his respect for others, and his extensive efforts to ensure the organization he leads works successfully with other organizations in our community. And let me just give you some of those other organizations. They include the collaboration with Dare County's Department of Health and Human Services, Dare County's Emergency Management, Hatteras Island Community Emergency Response Team, Cape Hatteras Electric Foundation, and the Outer Banks Community Foundation. Dennis, I have no clue what you do when you're off time. <laughs> yeah. You just need to step up to the plate a little bit more. <laughs> it's through these partnerships that Dennis makes it possible for members of all of these organizations at Dare County to come together and find not only common ground, but a shared vision and solutions to the challenges that many in our community face. And we're not the only ones who have recognized the massive and positive impact that Dennis volunteer efforts have made in our community. Just this past April, he stood right here before you, before us in this past April, uh, and he was recognized as a recipient of the 2022 North Carolina Governor's Volunteer Service Award. Now, this is an incredible honor in itself uh, because they only give a few of these out in each county throughout the state uh, annually. So once again, Dennis was recognized by the governor for that. It's my honor on behalf of this board, unanimously selecting you, Dennis, as Dare County Board of Commissioners to recognize you as this year's uh, 2022 Dare County Citizen of the Year. Um, it's a better place because of you. Um, providing our friends and our neighbors that are in need. Your work and all that your work alongside of you is making a profound difference in so many, and we are abundantly grateful for all that you do. Um, at this time, I'd like to present with, to you <clears throat> a plaque, um, the 2022 Dare County Citizen of the Year awarded to Dennis Carroll. And Dennis, Thank you. The, the town of Manio has also wow. um, have has something for you to uh, sit on your shelf at home, and, uh, recognizing you as citizen of the year. And Manio's also got a goodie bag over here. So, right. Dennis, <laughs> let's rec let's recognize Dennis's family. Y'all yeah. stand if you would. Look at here. Come on up here. Come on up here. 
Come on up here and be with Dennis and myself. Come on up here. I'm going to ask, uh, since Commissioner Couch represents Harris Allen, I think he's got a few words, Dennis. He, he might, uh, there, he might, I don't know, no telling. He might even be challenging you. No telling what he's got to say tonight. <laughs> Board, would you, would you join, join us? <laughs> well, on behalf of all of our volunteers, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Dennis will never call on me in our meetings at <laughs> K. Better Snyder and Methods Men. He told me one time that brief and couch in the same sentence was bad grammar. So, but I, I just want to give you just a, a, a couple of tips about K. Better United Methods Men under uh, Dennis's leadership. Uh, this past uh, 18 months, uh, because FEMA will not raise uh, mobile homes, which are personal property, uh, we undertook a project that could not have been done with the Outer Banks community without the aid of the Outer Banks Community Foundation, where 14 mobile homes were raised nine feet above sea level. This allowed them to get out of the floodplain, and the uh, it was very emotional for me to be up here and talk about it because when you see families with kids and they're working two and three jobs just trying to make it every day, it'll rip your heart out. And it's just a fantastic thing to to a uh, project like that. Even if it's a mobile home, <clears throat> three bedrooms, you know, 60 footer, uh, it's still going to be about 48 to 52 thousand uh, dollars because of Dennis's leadership. Uh, we were able to get those done for about 19, essentially half. You had people doing all sorts of stuff, uh, engineering work. Uh, Dennis was doing uh, stamped engineer plans. He is a PE. Um, it's just an amazing thing. And Cape Adders United Methodist Men is actually seven different denominations, all of them Catholics. It's Cape Adders United Methodist Men because that's what the charter was in. But we've got men, women, teenagers, and it's just a real testimony to what a community can do when they resolve to act as to act and endeavor as one. One hundred percent of every dollar that comes into that organization goes out. Their unofficial motto is we fix our own roof. But I'd like to get a uh, picture if we could for posterity's Come sake. And the th here, thank the dude. family for Come coming here, coming out here. They want to go to dinner, so we'll make this quick. <laughs> I'm gonna, guys, I'm going to jump back here with, with my crew. Alita, Come on over here. Let's bounce things out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, come on. Come on, family. He's he's got a goodie bag over here. So I'm gonna I'm instead of asking Dennis to haul all this stuff, I'm gonna put it on the young young crowd. The young ones the young ones gonna have to hold this stuff. Abs absolutely. We we get on each other at Methodist Men and I want Dennis to know that we've got him a uh, gift certificate to Hardy's to go along with the with the goodie bag. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for being here. Thanks for being here. Good job. So it doesn't get any better than that. We are very, very fortunate to have the caliber of people in our community to do the things that uh, Dennis Carroll does. And so um, 
God bless him and, and the United Methodist men. County Manager, that completes the uh, Chairman's comments, so I'll turn it back over to you. Chairman, that brings us to public comment. Ladies and gentlemen, now's the time that's been set aside for public comment. <clears throat> if you have public comment tonight and you've not signed up, I'll ask you to raise your hand in a minute, and when you do, you can come to the podium and speak. Please limit your comments to five minutes. There's a green light up on the podium that will come on when your time begins. There's a yellow light that will come on when there's about a minute left. And when the red light comes on, you need to conclude your remarks. We have quite a few people here, I think, tonight that want to speak. So we're going to be a little more stern with the five minutes tonight than we usually are. So please, when the red light comes on, conclude your remarks so I don't have to interrupt you. But if you do not, we will close it right at five minutes so that everyone will have an opportunity to speak. Um, with that said, the first person on the list is Jason Collier. Jason, welcome this evening. Good evening. Thank you all for having me. Um, talk fast here. Um, Jason Collier, I'm a general contractor in Frisco, and I'm one of the parents that's involved in the Buxton, uh, the Burris Field Clubhouse down in Buxton. Um, I'm seeking reimbursement for some personal expense I've got, and that's a long backstory. Most everybody's aware of it at this time. Um, I was told you guys had voted not to reimburse at this point, which a week or so ago led me to look back at the May 16th meeting because I understood that you had voted to go ahead and proceed to finish the project. And I was amazed at the lack of detail and context in the, the description of that project and how that all had come to be. Um, and listening to that video, it struck me that there was this group of incompetent parent to parents that hatched this plan to get some materials donated and finish this building. <clears throat> And we'd gotten in over our heads and weren't going to be able to finish it and needed the county to come in and, and rescue us. And that's just simply not the case. Um, the original scope on that project was to simply salvage some remaining portion of framing that's been sitting there for several years, long before any of us got involved in it. We were going to dry the building in, set the windows and doors, and plan to finish it out over time. It came to my attention while we were doing that, that evidently the county had spent somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars on decking at the Pheasant Center up across the street. And I don't know that whether those numbers are fully accurate or not. Any six figure amount led me to say, well, hey, all we need is about 15 or 20 to come finish this this project that we're literally coming out of pocket for ourselves with cash and donated time. So it seemed like a reasonable request that was just to dry that structure in. So. We didn't have the time to get into it tonight. The email that I sent you guys last week details how that went from 20,000 to the, the elevated number that it was, and really to nobody's fault, but because of code requirements and insurance requirements and all this and that. Really tonight, I'm here more as a frustrated taxpayer than I am anything because you guys basically have willingly made a decision to pay more to get this thing finished than you otherwise would have and to take longer than you otherwise than it otherwise would have had you let the folks that were down there that got it started get it done. You had four county employees on site last week. You had a manager, an electrician, and two carpenters. I know back in April you were trying to hire electricians for $85 an hour. The electrical rough-in work that's billed in that $13,900 that I'm seeking reimbursement for was billed at $25 an hour. And I can go through line item after line item after line item of discounted rates that you guys were getting for that. So. Assuming those other gentlemen make $25 an hour, that's $150 an hour in labor rates that you guys are paying these guys to come from Manio, an already strained county workforce. Three hours round trip job time. So if they're lucky, they might get three and a half to four hours productive work on the site every day. Again, because of back history, you guys have made a choice to spend more to get the project done and take longer to get it done than you otherwise would have. You had a licensed, qualified, contractor on site, mobilized, I would say vested in the project, trailers, materials, and a team that none of which lives more than five minutes from the job site. So all that being said, and Bobby, in your words, if we didn't have all the back history, we would probably just go do something. Something can still be done. At the end of the day, everybody just wants to see it done. I'd like to get some of my money back. And I can tell you that there should be a way if, if you guys find it amongst yourselves based on the information you provided last week or anything you've heard tonight, if you find that, you know, 
throwing it, lumping it on the already strained county workforce that's going to have to travel three hours to go down there and bite this thing off isn't the best path, then we're still willing to do it. We've got donations lined up for uh, finished plumbing supplies. Uh, Dave Swanner once had agreed to put pilings in the ground for the handicapped ramps and refused to take money for it. Um, the main thing I wanted to leave you guys with, there's nobody that could finish that thing faster or for less. We'd still be willing to do it. It'd be great if we could just get the reimbursement though. I'm happy to make myself available for question if anybody has any. Okay, thank you, Jason. Do you want to speak to that or you want to move on? Um, yeah, if you don't mind, do that, county manager. Just so that everybody understands what's going on, this is a project that is years old. Um, a number of years ago, a group from down there wanted to add on to the concession stand at the Burris Field. Um, at that time, the cost to do what they wanted was going to be about $54,000, and the board said, no, we have a field across the street that has a concession stand and all the amenities. You can use that field. At that time, the, the Little League group that was there didn't want to do that, and they said, no problem. We'll get volunteers, and we'll do whatever we need to do here. Um, the board said that's fine if you want to do that. They started a project and then it didn't get finished. And as Jason just said, it sat there for a couple of years. Uh, it was deteriorating. We had our folks go down there and look at it. Whatever they had done was not done to code at that point. And it sat there a, little, a while longer and nothing was done. And so we sent our group down there. We said we were going down there to take it down to make it safe. Uh, mm -hmm. We were then asked, please don't take it down. We've got the volunteers, we've got the materials, we've got the things that we need to do to add to that uh, concession stand. And, and we'll do that work if you'll just let us do it. And we said, okay, do it. Um, they did do some work as Jason just described. Um, it did not get finished and then it sat there for a while. Um, I got an email from Jason saying they needed to finish it, but they did not have the materials and all that. And it was gonna be, Twenty-four to twenty-five thousand dollars to fit to to finish it, and would the county pay for it? I said, "Well, I've got to get confirmation on those numbers. And I've got to go back to the board." And he said, "At the same time, I'm seeking reimbursement for dollars that I've donated or put into the project. I want to be paid back." And I said, "Well, how much is that?" And he gave me an outline of that. I said, "Well, when we get some final pricing, I'll come to the board. We'll talk about it, and we'll see what happens." Um, and that's where we left it. Um, when I later got the numbers back from Jason, the cost of repair was like $70,000 more than the whole project would have been to start with. And I said, no. And I think <laughs> I came to you all at that time and told you what was going on, told you the backstory about what was happening. Um, we later talked about it again at a meeting and we said, let's get our folks out there to go see what we can do to get it buttoned up, get it cleaned up, get it safe. And we'll get a price on that. Um, our staff is working on that. I don't have that price yet. Uh, we think it's going to be significantly less than seventy thousand dollars. Th this is a um, concession stand. That's correct. A concession stand. A Not bathroom. an apartment building or an office building. It's, it's going to have a, a, a bathroom and some storage, storage. And, and an extension on it. You go see it on the side of a, of a concession stand. Right. A new siding. Right. Um, one of the requirements that we had when they when we authorized them to do it as volunteers was it had to be done to code. Um, and so we did send the code enforcement officer down there to be sure that it was done to the building code because the first go at it was not. Uh, and we were concerned that someone would get hurt or there'd be a problem. And so that's the backstory. Nobody has promised anybody anything. Nobody has agreed to pay anybody anything. Nobody knew that Mr. Collier was spending his own money that he wants to be reimbursed for. If he did do that, we didn't authorize it. In fact, I think there's a... a email from Dustin to him at some point that says you probably ought not to do anything else because you know, we don't know where we're going with this. And so that's where we are with it. Um, our, we got to do something with it. As I told you at the last meeting, we, our plan is for the staff to go do that. Uh, we did have staff down there to look at it because we can't evaluate it. if We don't send our people down there. Um, and so we did send our people down there to evaluate it. Um, they're looking at it, the price and the materials and the things that we need to do to get it fixed now. Um, we've tried two or three times with volunteers and we haven't gotten it finished yet. And so our key is to get it done. Um, he's telling us tonight he's got volunteers again that want to do it. and He's got materials that he wants to do it with. That's the first I've heard that part. Um, 
Again, all we want it to do is get finished. We want to get built to code uh, and either we do it or they do it, but somebody has to do it or else we have to take it down and it doesn't make sense to take it down. So that's where we are. Um, in terms of reimbursement, that you know, we haven't agreed to reimburse anybody. Uh, our understanding was this was a volunteer project and typically when you volunteer, you don't get reimbursement, but that's where we are. So that's how we got where we are. And you know, as we move forward, when I get some numbers, I'll come back to you and you can then decide how you'd like for us to move forward. Okay. Thank okay. you, County Manager. Yes, sir. Well, you had you had five minutes at public comment, Jason, so we, we'll get back to you in, uh, once we get some notice. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. We have a conversation County so Manager. Fun. Sure. We can talk. Yeah. Um, next on the list is, it's like Rita Webb. Good evening, Ms. Webb. I would like to talk to you about the proposed development at the end of Roanoke Island around the airport road. The conditions of airport road have rapidly deteriorated after the, the last few years. We have increasing traffic to both the aquarium, we have the new dispatch center, we have the new um, SPCA, which would definitely be needed. There's increased traffic at the airport. Those of us who built our homes in the hope that we would have an environmentally safe, secure, and reliable retirement a piece of property are disgusted. It is not safe to turn out of Old County onto, De onto Airport Road. We have an increase in our visitors, which is a good thing for the community. We are going to take down trees and jeopardize wildlife habitat. We're going to be in 56 more septic systems, which I think is a pollution. I think the tra increased travel is causing us to have pollution. And frankly, I think it's about time that we asked ourselves, are there other areas that we could maybe split this development up instead of doing it in one specific area? I myself am seriously thinking of trying to sell my property and moving. I'm disgusted. Dare County has been my dream home since 1974 when we first came to the Outer Banks as visitors. And we have brought our land in the confidence that we would have a quiet retirement area, which is definitely not the case now. And it is not safe for children. We need sidewalks on those roads. Airport Road needs to be completely resurfaced. They're putting patches on the patches is like Band-Aids. Environmentally, I spent 35 years of my life in healthcare, most of which was a critical care RN level and EMS instructor. What I would like to see definitely done with some of our community is, what are we going to do about healthcare here? Recently, one of our local physicians has moved, one has retired, 2,200 people no longer have health primary care providers. I've had five primary care providers in 23 years, which is unheard of. It just so happens I'm lucky. I have a healthcare background and I know what I'm talking about. But I would appreciate it if you would think of some alternative areas and maybe some alternative development areas that could be included in your project, but could be spread in a larger area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Kimberly Head. Welcome, Ms. Head. Hey, Mr. Witter. Thank you for your time. Um, as most of you know, I bought a house uh, here about seven years ago. I bought a house in an ex flood zone because um, that's what I wanted. I wanted a house that did not flood. I did not want to be on the sound taking the risk of having a property that floods. I wanted to raise my four children in my home um, in a safe environment and not toxic. Uh, as most of you are aware, I do not have that. I have a house that floods, a house that floods with rain, a house that thankfully you guys have supported us and pumped the water from our property. Um, but our house continues to flood. It's in the bowl. I have reached out to NC Rebuild for assistance. Um, I 
continue that path in trying to get support. Unfortunately, the system is broke. FEMA does not support us because we're in an ex-flood zone. Dare County does not support us because we are at 13 feet above sea level, even though two weeks ago, my property flooded. I get four inches of water underneath my house. I have a crawl space ninja, thousands of dollars, and it pump, and some sump pumps up under there. And it pumps the water out and I keep, I keep making it work, but it is a very stressful situation. I have put my house up for sale and tried to sell my home, but I have structural damage. Structural damage that is gonna cost well over $100,000 to make repairs. All of our subfloors have to be ripped out. Um, again, NC Rebuild is working with me on this and I'm going through the very long process since 2016. Um, I understand affordable housing is needed, absolutely. I do understand that. And what I'm asking though is that as we move forward as a community, we work on foundation along the way. We need to ensure that the current community that we have is being taken care of or that we are resolving some of these issues. And yes, I'm only one house, but like I've told NC Rebuild, if they do raise my house, I will have seven houses that flood around me. I really feel that being in the bowl, perhaps, one, we need to go move forward with our flood plan and make sure that we have the appropriate plans in place and that we do take care of the whole community, the whole neighborhood, the whole island. Um, it's, I'm not out for just myself, but I am, I am in need of the county to continue to try to have that foundation. Um, I guess that's it. Um, if you guys could just ensure that as you continue to plan for the affordable housing, as you continue to look at homes being built and things taking place, that you also consider the community that is here that has been struggling for the past six, seven years, trying to keep their home, trying to keep things safe and, um, and livable, quite honestly. Um, I just ask that you guys consider us too. Thank you, Ms. Head. Thank you. Barbara Sabunka. What's her name? Can I imagine? Would you repeat her name, please? It's Barbara Sabunka. Sabunka. Right yes. Yes, ma'am. I just I didn't I didn't understand him, Miss Sabunka. So welcome. I, I was trying to get it correct. Good evening, <clears throat> excuse me. Good evening, my name is Barbara Spunka and I, uh, I reside with my husband at 132 Garrett Circle, uh, Mania. Uh, I am here uh, talking again about this situation with the Evans track and the development of such named track for housing. Um, you've probably all heard of the movie Jurassic Park and how scary it was. Well, I think the Evans track is gonna become a disastric park. You cannot have 56 homes, one on top of another, on 33 foot wide plots and not have overcrowding. I have heard things from neighbors who have lived in the area for a long time that the percolation problem is going to arise. That good fresh water is going to be very hard to percolate. And when you have 56 homes with septic, and you have water trying to come up with waste trying to go down. I'm not an engineer, but that doesn't sound very good to me. Uh, I just want to make a comment towards Rita, two comments towards Rita, who had very good points. She came here in the 70s. My husband and I, and I've made this a point before, it's a part of public record. We were two young pups who didn't know what we were doing and came down here to beautiful Roanoke Island and purchased through the grace of Malcolm Fearing's, Malcolm Fearing's father, Keith, a lot in what was Breakwood One. Breakwood One uh, no longer exists. Anyway, that was our dream. 
1984. We did not develop that property until 2006. It was our dream retirement place. And now in our older years, we're just kind of scratching our head as to where is our dream going. Uh, also, kind of getting off the track, but this is something Rita also brought up about health care. Uh, the practice that uh, my husband and I use has now one physician, one for the people of Roanoke Island. And it's like, well, if you get sick, you go to urgent care. Or if you get sick, you just go you know, out of the county someplace. I want my physician that I've been working with for years who has my records, who knows me, not some person in urgent care, who I'm sure they're all qualified over there, attending to me. One quick story that I just heard this morning. Health care is in crisis mode, everybody. A very, very, very close friend of my daughter's who is a nurse in Savannah. She's a registered nurse and she works in critical care. Critical care should have in her department one nurse for every two patients. She now addresses eight patients a night. Women are not going into nursing. Women don't want to do the work. The doctors are fleeing. What is going on? We're, we're going to be looking at this, folks. And now you're putting 56 more homes with more people who need medical attention. Owning property is a privilege. It's not an entitlement. And I feel that we're just giving out lots, giving out homes to anybody who wants to come down the pike. It was raised as a question uh, last time we had a meeting about whether or not these homes are going to be transitory. Are people coming here for vacation cottages? Are people coming here to have a home that they can rent out? I don't want a big transient community in back of me. I'm sorry. The people are coming in here because they work here. They need jobs um, here. That's a whole different story. But um, rentals, cottages, I'm not so sure about that. I don't want to get political, but the feds have raised rates and the housing industry is going to start to tank. So what happens when you build the 56 homes and people cannot get the mortgages? People cannot afford these houses. Is that going to become a ghost town? Are you going to have 56 empty houses just sitting there along Airport Road, which is a disaster, as other people have pointed out? This road needs to be fixed and maintained. If I was a young person and had small children, I wouldn't want my child on a two-wheeler heading out to Airport Road to ride his or her bicycle. It's not a safe place. I'm just about at the end of my time here. I see I have four seconds. Thank you for your time, for your understanding, and something has to be done with this project. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you. Kathy Makins. Welcome this evening, Ms. Meekins. Thank you. My name is Kathy Meekins. I live on the north end of the island, just off of Airport Road. I know people have talked about this incessantly, but the impact on that road just seems not to have been addressed, not only at where it intersects the main highway, but going all the way up the highway. There's just, there's no room on either side. It's a very dangerous road at the process that it is in now with all the people going to the aquarium and all the other things that are out at that end of the island. Something has got to be done. Um, DOT needs to come out there and assess it. You're gonna have amazing traffic that's already lining up past the turnoff going to Air Airport Road. You're having people backed up on Airport Road. Plus, you got your traffic that's just traveling back and forth on the main highway. Please look carefully at everything that you guys are doing because this impacts a lot of people that have lived on that road for a long time and have never been considered to have something improved. If you can't improve that road, 
then in you good and in, in good conscious cannot allow that development to go in. Other ones are going in and they've been approved apparently, but this one is a big impact on that entire area. Please, if you have a good conscience, use it and help all of us that are trying to make this catastrophe not happen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Meekins. I'm sorry, I may get this in wrong. I can't read it. Is it Elizabeth Granith? Elizabeth, last name? It's Graninsky. Graninsky, I'm sorry. My father-in-law was planning for, let's see, on the planning board, commissioners and mayor of Mantio, Gus Graninsky. Okay. I'm so shaken up right now, I can't even speak. Number Take your one, time. Take your time. <clears throat> thank you. Number one, I was born on Airport Road 62 years ago. And I know for a fact in World War II, Airport Road was built. It's exactly one mile long for an extra airstrip for airplanes. So it's a historic landmark. The forest that we're referring to, this 56 acres, is the last large group of trees of a maritime forest. If we could do diggings there, we could probably find anything from Indian relics to World War II stuff. I remember going down the Boy Scout Trail. I know there's a bunch of stuff back there. It's a shame the land is continuously being destroyed for, for the almighty buck. People have told me, like Jonathan Johnson, well, it's easier to just go ahead and clear cut instead of going around the trees. Can't we partnership or come to some kind of compromise, maybe leave lot 44 to 56 <laughs> as a storm buffer and to absorb water or leave a, you know, a row of trees between their road and back of the houses of Airport Road? It's sad when money ends up destroying forts that were there already and historical sites all over the North End, because money talks and rich people get away with it. We've had a slew of flooding all over these housing developments, all over the North End, from Airport Road to Holly Ridge. Nothing was gonna be done a few years ago when they were all flooded until one of the commissioners stood up and said her house was underwater. The state dude was telling him, oh, you, we'll get to you in two weeks. That's crazy. <clears throat> what do you think's gonna happen when all these trees are clear cut? Screw insurance companies. So many people in these developments were told they would have ditches, retention ponds, and et cetera. It was never done. Too many broken promises. Like ditches all over our island is to begin with are not maintained along with rain drains because I have followed them and they're filled with roots and they're fallen in or clogged up. Roanoke Island, since I was a baby, was a theme of trees. And now we are drastically allowing that to change. When the big storm hits, <clears throat> and it will, and even a little one, are these land developers and builders prepared to be sued when their houses that they sold are destroyed or flooded in all these places? People I've heard already are selling their homes. I guess that's what you want, us to either keep quiet or move. Catherine Fagan. <clears throat> Welcome this evening, Ms. Fagan. Thank you, Ms. Woodard, um, Chairman. Um, I appreciate y'all listening to all of this. And, you know, once again, we're here because of that development. Actually, two <laughs> things. And one, I'm sorry, what? I know. I told you. <laughs> Somebody got their phone on? I think it's vaccine from Island. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Very convenient. I thought you were a ventriloquist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me start over. Oh, absolutely. Start <laughs> up time, Bobby. Start yeah. up time. Okay, there, in listening to the other people who have spoken, you know, there's a real common thread here. Greed is ruining what we have. It's in healthcare problems, and it's in this development. 
this development is going to bring on so many problems and so many unhealthy uh, results. You know, the 56 new homes with uh, 56 new septic systems. The water table is rising. And as she pointed out, you've got water trying to go down and more water is coming up. And um, there has to be a way to make everybody happy. The health care, the, the, the other issue with that is we were told uh, in the letter that I got from the health care system that one of the big problems was with the reason that we lost our physicians was because of housing. We need to talk to Biden Healthcare and find out what the real problem is because it's not housing. One of the people that left, that, that physician, his family goes back generations. The other one had a house across the street from the practice. That is not accurate. I think they weren't pumping through enough patients because the physicians that, they, that are no longer there, they listened to you. They took the time and they listened to you. They didn't rush you through. So that's greed. The greed and the development. Number one, the public was not engaged. The planning board is supposed to engage the public. The board of commissioners is supposed to engage the, the public. We were not given any notice. There is no way that a project this size should not have notice given to the adjacent property owners. We should have notice. We should have had an opportunity to say, this is a bit much. This situation is not healthy. It is not safe. And when something happens, are you guys gonna be okay with that? <clears throat> this road is already <clears throat> horrendous. But there might be a way for everybody to be happy. Um, in my years of practicing law, the best deals are win-win. The best settlements are win-win. We both need to win. The people who want to develop this property, they want to make money on it. That's why they're doing it. The people who are opposed to it want the trees and everything to stay as it is because we don't want the flooding. We want the wildlife <coughs> habitat. We want that. So if we were given some time to work with the state, we could do very much what Jockey's Ridge did. I went back and I researched what did Carol Lee's de Balm do. Now, what they'll tell us about this project is, but this project is already approved. It's a done deal. There's nothing you can do. Well, you know what? Nonsense. Yes, there is. And I could address that letter <coughs> uh, in more detail with you personally because I've gone through that. But you know that that project that Carol Lee Stabon was holding up for Jockey's Ridge had to have been approved because if the story is true that she stood in front of a bulldozer, you know they were already starting to develop. They were already going to be taking that down. And she stood there and stopped them. Then she worked with the um, she worked with uh, state legislatures and they got uh, land grants together and they got uh, grants from the county and grants from the uh, think the state it may have been national too to get together and now we have Jockey's Ridge now I'm sure that the people were developing that I couldn't find what they made on that but you know they didn't give away the property so I'm sure they got something so I propose that if we can't just plain stop it and I doubt we can because greed talks money talks and the people behind this project are the big names in the county and they always win so if we are able to have some time to work with the state legislature, there's the National Park Service does some land acquisition. And since our bird migratory path goes through the national park system and through that track of land that they want to destroy, maybe we can work with them. There's the state land acquisition division. Maybe we can work with them. But there are my lights coming on. So. Just we need time to try and find an avenue that can be a win-win so that you don't have so many, I don't know how many people live around there, hundreds certainly, um, unhappy and very disgruntled, and you don't have an unhealthy situation. And people who have bought it and invested, they, they make their money. So maybe that might be a solution y'all could think about because butting heads is not going to make anybody happy. And there you have it. Thank you, Catherine. Michelle Lewis. <clears throat> Good evening, Ms. Lewis. Good evening. I'm Reverend Dr. Michelle Lewis, and I am an unaffiliated candidate for United States Senate here in North Carolina. And as I've traveled around the state, and talked with economically disadvantaged people all over the state. Um, 
The problem that we have in our community with access to housing is a problem that's in every community in the state of North Carolina. And I wanna thank you for looking for solutions. But as I see it, there are a number of possible solutions. And one would be placing limits on the resources that corporations and developers can buy up for rental properties in our community. Another is creating and building on properties held by private entities and then you know, adjusting um, costs with using AMI. But um, until this board exhausts all the county's potential options, uh, including partnership with these private entities, one of them being the United Methodist Church. So I am a United Methodist pastor. I'm ordained in the United Methodist Church. And I don't know if you all are aware, but the United Methodist Church does own the largest, one of the largest pieces of contiguous undeveloped property here on the Outer Banks. And I would suggest a uh, potential partnership with United Methodist Church in potentially developing housing for communities because United Methodist Church does have um, actually a worldwide program that addresses uh, make healthy communities. And so I would like to put that forward as a potential possibility. Um, and the other reason, and I'm a descendant of the Freedmen's Colony and I wanna talk for just a moment about cemeteries. You know, the dignity that my and many of your ancestors were denied in life um, by building on this property at the north, on the north end, um, it'll deny them dignity and death with further development of the property. Um, cemeteries are one of the most important pieces of American history. And it wasn't uncommon for cemeteries to be the first properties owned by blacks because of their communal need. And cemeteries provide for all of us the social, anthropological, and archaeological histories of place. They provide histories about a community and a people that otherwise would not be known. And there have already been numerous black and white burial grounds here on Roanoke Island that have been destroyed by development. And this is a form of cultural genocide taking place in our community. There needs to be a plan in place before building that adequately and with appropriate community input addresses the proper reinterment of human remains because our collective histories here are important, not just for our local history, but they're an important part of American history as well. Additionally, the current infrastructure on the island does not adequately meet the needs of a growing population. Increasing the population without addressing infrastructure here does a a great disservice to those of us already living here on Roanoke Island. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Kathy Mitchell. Welcome, Ms. Mitchell. Good evening. Um, I have lived at 109 Garrett Circle for 34 years, and I've been a Dare County resident since 1980. I agree with many of the statements and comments that have been made this evening. And I have talked about these issues as well at recent planning board meetings. Like many of the others who are here tonight, I've seen tremendous loss of natural areas and disturbing changes in land use practices in Dare County. But this is not about my personal feelings on these issues. Fact, before too long, we will be down to the last few slivers of buildable land on the Outer Banks. And the def definition of buildable seems to be changing rapidly too. We know that there's a limit to the pressures that these fragile maritime barriers can withstand. It's not 1980 anymore. It's time to reassess the way these decisions are made. It's time to start measuring the intrinsic value of property as a natural community that is part of a vitally important ecosystem. This is already happening in other North Carolina communities that are setting aside land for conservation and CO2 sequestration credits through um, the group, I believe it's the North Carolina Land and Water Fund. 
This planet, North Carolina, and this planet will continue to change in ways that we cannot control. So let's put some different options on the table before we run out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Louise Gray. What was her first name? <clears throat> Welcome this evening, Ms. Gray. Thank you. Happy to be here. I would like to start out by saying I do commend this body for the work you've done over the past several years in meeting some of the needs of the county. I know you worked hard on that. Uh, my husband and I built our home and moved in in 19, March of 1968 on Airport Road. It has been um, back in the mid-80s. It was flooded. We were pumping, using a boat pump to pump water across the highway, and then we couldn't do that, so we put it under the culvert that's out in front of us. When it rained heavily, there was a, the Navy had put, when they dug dirt from the side of the road to build that highway, they had dug some holes over in the woods, and there was a body of water there that stayed gradually as kids came, people came through the woods and played in it, it went away. So during those times, the first time, the second time was when the, the last flooding that they're talking about, each time we had home, water under our home, we pumped it out. And we still get water occasionally in the back. It hasn't been under the house in several years now. <laughs> and we hope it doesn't go anymore. We did build above bricked up above, but it still can go under. Um, a couple of things I wanted to mention is that there are eagles, they are not bald eagles, but their family and some of their extended family living in North End and over in other areas. And they are beautiful when they are flying. We, we really enjoy them. There are also crows that fly around and fly, but they need water too. <laughs> um, it's um, it's been a, it's been hard when we've had that. I worked for the county and the health department as a public health nurse for uh, thirty and a half years. Retired, worked uh, with social services as a contract nurse for twelve years. Then did a little bit of uh, private duty. My husband is a native. He was born, grew up in in Manio, grew up in Dare County. So. Uh, I feel I grew up in a very rural farm, tobacco farming area, so I was not used to flooding at all <laughs> until we built our home down here. I wanted to move back to Richmond, Virginia. But um, this is um, trying to get away. Uh, I had heard talk some years ago about build, building, going down another road to the from the right uh, Steve Bass Knight Road or Etheridge Road, one of the others, trying to get another way to get to the airport for the emergency vehicles and airport personnel, some of the ones that were working there. I don't know of anything that ever came from that or if that is a possibility for doing an, another road if it is decided to go ahead with this. My understanding is that most of these houses will be small and that could be a concern because you figure there are going to be at least two cars for each house. The road is narrow, uh, bikes ride up and down it, people walk up and down it, and people run on the side to get on the road when they can. Most of them move over. Some of the bikers and some of the walkers won't move off the road. And that I see as a health hazard. <coughs> as far as flooding, that's um, hard to control. But if my primary thing would be that if you can find another way to get through some of the traffic over and keep some of the trees, they're clear cutting, which takes away when a hurricane comes and, and they will come, we've had them and they'll come again. And I believe that there'll be more destruction of some of the homes as a result of that. If, if there's something not done, if they could keep trees uh, or that uh, even uh, and plant encourage people to plant plants or small trees that absorb a lot of water. I read about a tree that 
up so would drink up to ten uh, up to a thousand gallons of water in a day. I'm still I read it in a, in a paper newspaper, but I forgot the name of it, so I'm no help there. <laughs> but I appreciate you letting me speak at this time today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Gray. That's all the silence I have. Would anyone else like to speak at public comment? Yes, ma'am. If you'd come up to the podium and state your name, please. Hi, my name is Diana Lee Knight. I live at 184 Airport Road. And as you know about, if you may or may not know, Airport Road has become so congested. And then coming out on the 64, you got to sit there sometime for five minutes or more to get out on that road. I re I've been living here since 2006 when I used to live on the sound side and I would come out and make a left on the 64 and there was no problem. Never. I work at Tuesday morning in Nags Head. It takes me 40 minutes, guys, 40 minutes to get to Tuesday morning because I got to drive through Manio and we want to add 54 more units on top of we've already got two projects that their county is going to be doing for I forget how, what they called it, uh, for people of lower income for those properties. And then you're going to add all those cars onto Manio too. And now you want this? There's got to be something, some way that we can work together. And I don't like the fact that we had nothing to do with those uh, properties that you're going to change to lower income. And I come from Maryland and I know about lower income places. I've lived a couple streets across from them, and we had nothing but problem after problem after problem after problem from those areas. And you're going to put two in Manio, and now you want this. How many more properties are you going to allow to be built here where people have no say? I've worked with planning and zoning in Maryland. I'm a registered nurse. I worked at Shock Trauma in Baltimore. I saw the accidents that came in from small streets. And these are small streets. What are you going to do, tear down all those homes? on 64 to widen it? No, that won't fly and you know it won't. I've, I, like I said, I've been living here for quite some time now and I love my community. I decided, we decided on Manio because I don't want to be on the beach in the summertime unless I absolutely have to because of the congestion. And what's going to happen now is the congestion. It already has happened. I told you it takes me 40 minutes to get out of Manio. And that's when I'm going to work at 11. And then when I come home at 3.30, it's just as bad coming in. And you guys know what it's like at lunchtime. You might as well forget it. You're not getting out anywhere near 40 minutes. So I'm asking you to please tell them not to build that many houses. We don't need them, number one. Number two, did you do a, a, a survey at what all these cars were going to do? Did you guys do that? I don't think so. I didn't read about it in the Coastland Times. And I know there's a way for them to count how many more new cars. And if it's two per household, that's uh, what's 54, eight, 108 cars that you're adding to Manio. Come out of here at 11 o'clock, at 10, 30, well, I usually leave at 10 o'clock to allow myself enough time because I've come up along accidents, road, they're fixing the road, doing something. And it's taken me longer to get to work. If I get to work early, I'm happy. I sit in my car and I play on my phone. I don't go in until I'm due. But it's pretty bad when I got to leave my house at 10 to get to Tuesday morning where the first food line is in Nags Head. So I don't think you guys did a road survey. I don't think you did a, a survey on how, many, how that amount of cars is going to affect our community. And I don't know how many... Uh, of these, uh, of those two properties that you have down here in Manio, uh, how many cars those are going to be affected? I haven't read anything more about you's built, you know, changing the buildings, tearing them down, making big tall structures like Ocean City, Maryland. Um, that's why we stopped going there and started coming here. And I learned about uh, Na uh, Outer Banks in 1992 when I met my husband. And I've been coming down here ever since. And I chose Manio because I love Manio. And you know a woman gets what she wants. And I'm here to tell you, this is not what I want. And if you need any help, 
I got a big mouth. I'll help you. I have no problem saying how it is. And some of you know me. So I'm here to tell you there's a whole group out here that doesn't want this prop, these properties, and you approve something without us. How dare you? This is my life. I didn't even say that I'm handicapped. And I just got flown February 29th by helicopter. I've been taken three times by the ambulance to Greenville. So, and now you want more roads in more, more cars in Manio? I guess red means I'm supposed to shut up. So I got, Your time's up. Your time's huh? up. So my time's up. So I'm Diana Lee Knight. I would love to talk to you at any time. Just call me. I'm in the phone book. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak in public comment? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Richard Hodgins. I live on Daphne Lane, adjacent to where this very large housing project is going to go. And what I would like to know is, has an environmental impact study been done? Is there going to be one? I mean, are we just going to have to band together and take legal action here to make that happen? I just don't know how you can go through with this without, without studying what the consequences might be. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Other public comment tonight? Anyone else like to speak at public comment? Yes, sir. Welcome this evening, Mr. Ferry. Mr. Woodard and fellow board members, uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for being accessible to the people of our county. Uh, sometimes when it's even uncomfortable. Uh, but I know the dedication that you have to our community, and I appreciate that dedication. And that's why I'm here tonight. Um, the subject I'm going to talk about is health care uh, and or lack thereof. Um, and um, I went before the Manio Board of Commissioners last Wednesday and addressed the board in public comment. They gave me five minutes to. And I've tried to practice, and I'm going to try to get it done in five minutes. But I've never been before you with such anxiety in the delivery of a message. And I've been before this board all the way back when Mayor Owens was a county chair. So it's been a long time, but at this point in time, I'm, I'm troubled. And what I'm troubled about is what has occurred in health care on Roanoke Island. And I'm not coming before you to criticize any doctor, <laughs> any nurse, any practitioner, the Vidant uh, Hospital in Chesapeake on the beach, or their board. And I repeat that, I am not coming here to criticize them because I know many of them personally and I know how dedicated they are to our community to serve. But I have questions. Why am I coming? I'm gonna give you a real quick history. Uh, when I went to the Manio board and many of them are here tonight, I didn't know this Fearing fellow. His name was W.D. Fearing, W.B. Fearing and rode a horse. In 1890, he was a doc, and he traveled the island. Um, my family's been involved in health care since then. My father uh, and my grandfather built the first clinic on Roanoke Island. In fact, Betsy's daddy was, the, was Dr. Harvey, who not only served our community and patients in the human form, 
But Betty Kellogg told me a story when she took a dog there <laughs> and he took care of that dog. Mm -hmm. When Dr. Harvey left to go into the military, the Coast Guard, um, Walter Holton was recruited in that facility. Walter, Dr. Holton served us for 44 years. So we are a bit spoiled on the island. We don't know anything but ex compassionate, caring health care. That's all we've ever known. Things are different now. Um, I got a letter, as over 3,000 people did, maybe some of y'all, we will not treat you anymore. You have to go to Virginia, Greenville, Camden. That's their time, not mine. Uh, that is concerning. I know it has to be concerning for you. Um, I asked my 95-year-old mother, and you know, maybe I shouldn't have said that, her age. <laughs> Mom, do you know what this means? She said, no. What does it mean, Malcolm? You have no primary care doctor. She said she didn't know what that means. So, you know, well, that means you can't get your prescriptions filled. A large majority of our population does not understand that. So I'm coming before you all as I've had in the past, to ask for help. But I'm not saying it in a way, as my daddy said, don't bring me problems, bring me some solutions. And I'd like to offer a suggestion that a study commission or task force be formed as soon as possible to include whoever the town of Manio would like to put on, and I'm sure there would be a limit of whoever they would want, a group of y'all's representatives to call in our House and Senate reps to see if we cannot address this. There's the political solution, but also to ask Dr. Sheila Davies to the Health Department, could the Health Department also be involved and to include members of the general public. There are many, many people that are willing to help you with this issue. And I did it pretty quick, Bobby. <laughs> so I wanna thank you, each and every one of you for your service to our community. And there are many people that would be willing to help you with this issue. Thank you again. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Malcolm. Is there other public comment this evening? Anyone else like to speak at public comment? Seeing no hands here, is there any public comment in Buxton? No comment from Buxton. With that, Mr. Chairman, we close the public hearing. Thank you, County Manager. Um, out of respect for those who spoke this evening under uh, public comment, I'm going to reserve the right to ask the County Manager to uh, um, respond to that public comment with respect to the housing issue that um, most of you have said that you had no input on so county manager so in north carolina you have zoning ordinances and you have subdivision ordinances and to adopt a zoning ordinance or a subdivision ordinance you're required to have public hearings and a number of things to do that it goes through the planning board and so we have a code book, an ordinance book, and we have ordinances in, in it. And the ordinances are the rules by which we go by and which we're required to follow for the development of property. When those rules were adopted, uh, we had the requisite public hearings and the public had input and the community had input. And the board at the time they were adopted, adopted those rules. And there's, those become and are the rules by which people are allowed to use their land. Um, once you adopt those rules, uh, there's two ways you can do it. One is you have rules that are rules by right. The other is you have conditional use permits. Um, in a conditional use permit, you cannot tell the person they can't use their property for a, a, a purpose for which the rules allow, but you can add conditions to it to um, 
make it better to mitigate problems. Uh, development by right, you can't do anything except say yes. Uh, in a subdivision ordinance, you have the public hearings, you then adopt the ordinance, you put what the values of the community are in the ordinance, and the ordinance is then adopted. People are then allowed to use their property in compliance with the rules that you put in place. And you can't change the rules in midstream. So if you want to come in and you have a lot that says it's 15,000 square feet and you can build, um, I don't know, a 2,000 square foot house on it and you buy your lot, the board can't come in later and say, oops, sorry, you can't build a house on this lot anymore. We've changed our minds. You're, you're vested. You have a right to build on your property under the rules that were in place and follow those rules. And if you follow those rules, much as the board uh, wants to make everyone follow the rules, the board has to follow the rules as well. The subdivision rules say that if you meet certain requirements, then you're allowed to subdivide your property and sell lots. Uh, in this particular case, the developer met every one of the rules that are in our ordinances. Now, we can argue about whether we got good rules or bad rules or whether the rules ought to have more teeth in them or do other things. But the rules as they exist right now allow the developer to do what he's doing on that property. And the board doesn't have the right to change that. If the board tonight voted to withdraw any approvals, um, the lawsuit that would get filed tomorrow would be resolved by next Friday because we couldn't win that lawsuit. The, the law was clear. Uh, we have to follow the rules exactly as we require people who live under those rules to follow the rules as well. Um, again, doesn't mean the rules are right. It doesn't mean they couldn't be improved, but that's what's there. Uh, and this developer hasn't done anything wrong. Uh, someone mentioned an environmental impact statement. Um, there is no requirement for a, an environmental impact statement anywhere in the state that I'm aware of for a subdivision ordinance. Hang on. Well, it, Kathy, if you know all the rules, then you should have shared those with me because I've done it. To, I, I'll commend you to Dave Owens' book. And it says exactly what I'm telling you, that if you have development by right, you can't come in and revoke it and change the rules in midstream. There's vested right statutes and vested right ordinance that gives the developer those rights. And you know that to be the law. And hang on, you sit, you talk. Um, and so what our board is doing is following those rules as they are in our books now. Um, there are rules that those folks have to follow. They have to get permits. They have to get uh, stormwater permits. They have to get uh, environmental permits for their septic tank. And if they can meet those rules, then the state's required to issue those permits as well. They can't, the state can't come in and say, even though you comply with all of our rules, we're not going to let you do what our rules allow you to do. The state can't do that, and neither can the county. And so we're in the unfortunate position that after hearing all that you all had to say, there's not a lot they can do going forward to stop a project that is compliant with all the rules that are in place. Uh, that's not the law that we made. Those aren't the rules that we made, but those are the rules that we have to live by. And so that's what our county has done. That's what our planning board has done. And, and that's why this person is allowed to use his land to under the rules that are there, just as you were able to use your land under the rules that were there when you built your house. And so th that's the rules in North Carolina. And, you know, you know, if we want to go back and change the rules, we can do that, but you can't change them retroactively to someone who's already vested into the program. So that's where we are. Thank you, County Manager. Okay. That, uh, I appreciate your response to that. Sure. Public comment. I'm sorry, ma'am. Public comment is over. County Manager. I know, but I sure. Sorry, ma'am. You're out of order. County Manager. Uh, item three on the agenda is the Dare County Cooperative Extension, Extension Report. And Tanya, I turn the podium to you. Right. The board Tanya, and commissioners. Thank you.
We'll call the Dare County Board of Commissioners back to order, and I'll turn it over to the county manager at this time. Yes, sir, we're back. And uh, MC Cooperative Extension has a report, and Tanya's here to make that report. Thank you. Thank you. Tanya, thank you for your patience. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Well, hello from Dare County Extension, Chairman of the Board, Commissioners. It's a wonderful honor to be here this evening to deliver to you our report to the people for 2021. This past year has been exciting, and we look forward to sharing with you our progress, our actions, our impacts, and transformations achieved in this program year. North Carolina Cooperative Extension is an educational partnership helping people put research-based knowledge to work for economic prosperity, environmental stewardship, and an improved quality of life. And through delivering non-formal community-based education, we are committed to lifelong learning, individual and community empowerment, and inclusiveness. Now, Dare County Cooperative Extension has a wonderful team, and you can see us here. We were just at Dare Days on June 4th. We took over the Magnolia Pavilion in downtown Manio. We love to seek out opportunities where we can integrate with the community and get to know those people that we serve and share with them the resources that we have. And in just a few minutes, you'll hear from um, my county agents about the programs that they created and delivered this year. And I'll go ahead and introduce myself a little more formally. I am Tanya Lamo, and I serve as the County Extension Director. And 2021 has been a year of building a solid foundation of partnerships and networks within the community, along with navigating our path out of COVID and defining what our programs look like now that we're on the other side of this. I'm honored to serve the community and the county in this role. And what thoroughly excites me is when we see the impacts of our work. But before we dive too much more into this, our accomplishments, I would be remiss not to mention um, Kim Armstrong, who serves as our county administrative assistant in our office. She is the face of the office, and she works tirelessly to keep our finances in order. She writes articles. She does social media posts, answers the phone, greets customers and clients, and that's just a sliver of the work that she does. We certainly could not do our jobs without her support. So Cooperative Extension has three main program areas for which we serve here in Dare County, and they are 4-H, Family Consumer Sciences, and Horticulture, which leads me to introduce to you our 4-H agent, Ms. Ruth Perkins, and she's going to share with you about her experiences and programs this year. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, and good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Once again, my name is Ruth Perkins and I'm the Dare County 4-H agent. Like many other 4-H programs across the nation, Dare County 4-H has drastically been impacted by COVID-19. In 2021, we started right away to build back our programs for our youth and families. One of our first major accomplishments was having a 4-H'er, Slade Sloan, win gold at district and silver at state for his presentation on how to train your dog. This 4-H'er had no previous experience giving a presentation before joining Dare County 4-H. We've been also focusing on STEM projects with our electric program. One of the programs that we've been offering in this area is building mason jar lamps, as you can see in the photo here. This helps teach kids about electricity in the world around them. Two youth who have been participating in this program have been selected to attend Electric Congress in Charlotte, North Carolina next month where they will learn about career opportunities in STEM from major players in the field like Tesla, Duke Energy, Dominion Power, and more. All this while participating in fun activities and field trips along the way. Mason Jar Lamps are not the only program we've been offering. We've had 69 youth participate in 12 programs. This is include our most popular program, beginner sewing classes, growing microgreens, public speaking, and so much more. We've also raised funds to help send kids to camp and keep our programs affordable. We've raised roughly $2,000 to help with camp and made and sold candles to help keep our programs at low to no cost. We've also started doing a new program called Poultry Judging to help keep get youth involved in agriculture in their community. We have partnered with Island Farm with this program to help bring real life agricultural experience to our youth. Thanks to the funds we have raised, we were able to send 11 youth to camp at a much lower cost in 2021. 
They were able to experience ecology projects, kayaking, rock climbing, team building, and so much more. This year, we once again have 11 youth attending camp at a much reduced cost. We've had five youth attend the Northeast District Team Retreat, where they learned about electing their district officers, met kids from other counties in our area, and participated in team building activities. These youth are broadening their perspectives and taking their involvement beyond the county. In conclusion, Dare County 4-H is giving youth the skills and opportunities beyond just Dare County. Thank you so much for your continued support and your time this evening. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Ruth. And I'd like to now introduce you to, introduce to you Dee Furlaw, who serves our county as the Family Consumer Science Agent. Dee? Welcome, Dee. Well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. If y'all aren't familiar with the term family consumer science agent, back in the day we were called home economists. <laughs> okay. What, what so are they called now, D, again? Family and consumer sciences. Family and consumer yes. sciences. I was going to ask you what that was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually had the opportunity to start my career in cooperative extension here in Dare County in 1991. So we had our office down here on the street on the little hotel up on, we were on the second floor. And that was the famous county office building mm -hmm. at the time. I remember being in there. I'd have to go in and hook my foot around my, the desk of my chair so I wouldn't roll out from it. <laughs> that a little bit lopsided. <laughs> so we're really enjoying in our digs where we're at now. So um, I, I have the opportunity now since 2016 to be the Family Consumer Science Agent in both Dare and Terrell counties. And so I really appreciate you guys giving us a few minutes tonight to talk with you and let you know some of the things that we have going on here. Um, Uh-oh, she told me to use the clicker. Hey, I did that. Okay, so each month, um, healthy recipes pertinent to the growing season, the time of the year, the holidays, or what have you, were posted on the Dare County Cooperative Extension Facebook page, our Extension website, and our monthly Extension e-newsletter. So these recipes would come um, particularly with certain ingredients. For example, pumpkin. We'd say this is where they're grown. These are the types. This is the nutrition that it's included. And these are some recipes to help people uh, use Use the things that were available to them at that particular time of year so they can make wise, wise choices for themselves and their families. I've also been fortunate to work with Elizabeth Silverthorne, the director of the Beach Food Pantry. Um, Extension has provided them with approximately 1,500 packets um, that were created by Cooperative Extension that includes recipes for ingredients that are typically found in a food pantry. Uh, it also includes nutrition information and how to contact Cooperative Extension if these folks receiving these packets need more information about the SNAP program or the More in My Basket program. And Elizabeth also shared how she was having a lack of fresh vegetables in particular to give to her clientele because normally by the time she received the vegetables, they were already past their peak. She began a small um, garden, a little plot out there by the food pantry to see what would grow. And later on, I was able to um, write and receive a $1,000 grant to help her expand the, the growing opportunities that she would have to provide the fresh vegetables for her clientele. COVID made traditional in-person programming practically non-existent, so we all had to start looking for ways to get the information out from the universities, North Carolina State University and North Carolina State, uh, North Carolina A and T State University. So Charlie Burroughs of Current TV, I'm sure you are all very familiar with him. He agreed to come to the extension office and film me. And I'm tell you guys, I'm not used to doing that, so I was a little bit nervous, but I did it. And he told me that I was doing a good job. He's a good cheerleader like that. He told me I was doing a good job and I was going to keep getting better at it. So as of now, I've done six episodes, and if you've ever tuned in, you'll see me. I am delish and dare. And I'll tell you, I, I was a little hesitant about that name because it could go either way, but that's what we decided on. So I am delish and dare. So I have, I have Mr. enjoyed Chairman, are we allowing that? doing those programs. <laughs> And I am looking forward to doing some more. That is a great way to get out information about the different um, 
great healthy recipes that are out there to let people know about foods and nutrition. And who knows, maybe I'll be the next Food Network star. <laughs> you got the personality. <laughs> Another way uh, to reach out during COVID was at-home meal kits. So each kit had recipes that had all the ingredients that you need. I mean, right down to the quarter teaspoon of salt. We had all kinds of information, and occasionally we would also do an in-house video so that the people could log on to a website, link up with us, and they could cook together with us at their convenience. Um, so that was one great way to continue getting some nutrition information out into the community when getting out really wasn't advised. <coughs> and as a part of the meal kit preparation, I worked with the staff and participants of Monarch to get the kits together. Uh, Monarch is a great group. I'm sure you're all very familiar with them. And they're always trying to look for things to, to get the folks out in the community. And so they would bring the folks over to the extension office and they would be tasked with putting the recipes and all the ingredients together in the bag so they would be ready for pickup. They're just a great group and we really enjoy working with them. Um, again, during COVID, it was different to do in-office food programs. You might not think about food programs a lot, but when you're a family and consumer science agent and your job is to teach foods and nutrition, that's one of the things that you really have to think about is doing hands-on food programs. So as things started to open up and it was allowed, um, as per North Carolina Cooperative Extension Guidelines, myself, the participants, we had to wear masks. We had to be at least six feet apart. We all had to have our own utensils. We could not eat together inside. It was a difficult time to do the programming that I do. Now, I'm just so glad that we're just using best practices to try to get this information out. Um, our class, class size was very small, but since we've been able to open up, the in-house classes have been a real hit. People are so glad. They're glad to be able to get out. They're be glad to be able to see other people and learn new things. And our focuses have been on safe home food preservation and providing safe, inexpensive, nutritious meals for the family. And again, once things opened up a little bit more, uh, Kat Routon, from the um, Virginia Tillett Center had asked me to present the six weeks med instead of meds program to the participants there. This is an extension program that focuses on what it means to eat a healthy Mediterranean diet for better health, as opposed to just depending solely on medications if you have chronic disease or weight issues. So each week we would have a program. The participants would learn how to eat better. Uh, they would learn things about eating more whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, eating less fat, sugar, and red meat, uh, including exercise in their diet. They would get recipes, they would get handouts, they would take li little gadgets that they could take home to help them do the things that they were learning about in their home environment. Um, and so they also got to sample something. I would, lots of times in these classes, we would make something, but I would make it and take it to them just to sort of expedite things. And I was able to do several other programs at that center as well. Um, we talked about Monarch, and I've also been able not to just utilize their volunteer services, but I have actually been able to teach um, the folks at the Monarch Beach Club, as well as the Dare County Exceptional Children's Class. I go to Monarch each month for a program. As a matter of fact, I go tomorrow to see them. And we focus on health, nutrition, food safety, and so forth. And the exceptional children's class comes over. And these folks are so appreciative of the opportunity to learn new things. And you know that they're actually picking up on it because you can ask them questions at the end. And they're able to articulate the things that they've learned. What we're trying to do is help them to try new foods, to know things about basic food safety so that they can keep their food safe, and to know a little bit more about nutrition. And I've also been um, having classes again at the Bomb Center. It had been so long, and so I'm so glad to be back over there. Um, these are generally lengthier programs, taking about two hours or so. The folks have a brief lesson. Uh, we break up into cooking groups, and then we're able to get back together, enjoy a meal together, and discuss this. You know, wow, did you think this would taste good without salt? Have you ever used, you know, yogurt instead of eggs or something like that? And it's just a good way for people to, to interact with one another and practice the things that we're talking about.
So it's my pleasure to serve the people of Dare County. I enjoyed doing it back in 1991. I did it for five years. I've been in Terrell County, and now I'm doing both. And I just appreciate you guys taking a few minutes of your time to listen to the things that we've done this past year. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dee. And if you didn't catch that, 1991 has means that Dee has served extension for over 30 years. Last year, she celebrated her 30-year milestone serving cooperative extension. And we are blessed and thankful to have her here in this county working alongside of us and sharing her expertise with us. So Dee, hats off to you. Thank you for your time. Um, in addition to me serving as county extension director, my other area of responsibility is to deliver programming related to horticulture. Now this could not happen um, without our team of Extension Master Gardeners. So if they all could wave there in green and gray, this is just a fraction of the team of Extension Master Gardeners that we have. And they really embody what Extension is. They are an arm or an extension of the horticulture programming and resources and information that come down to us from the state and that we can disperse out into the, into the community. So they are a force to be reckoned with and they're wonderful to have. In fact, we have a really large team of Extension Master Gardeners in our county for the size of our county. We have 60 people that are certified as Extension Master Gardeners. Um, and then this last year in the fall, we were able to actually finally again have an in-person class where we could bring in new trainees. So we had 15 new people come in. They did 52 hours of extensive education, and they are working now to complete their volunteer commitment, and they will be certified in December, which will take our numbers up to 75 Extension Master Gardeners doing work here in Dare County. They are wonderful to work with. Um, and some of the things that they've done this last year was a library garden series where we partner with the Dare County Library System. Um, and this is something that they've done through the past, but because of COVID and the numbers were high in December and January, again, we had to pivot to online courses. However, this was a little bit frustrating at first, but we ended up reaching 553 participants in those webinars, which is record breaking. So it's really exciting when we look at the numbers of people that we're reaching in Dare County to learn about how to grow in the community in a coastal region and different types of plants and pollinators. We're really excited about the future of the Library Garden Series. Another requirement of being a master gardener in Dare County is to man the Ask a Master Gardener tables. So you can see in the picture here, there's four people behind that beautiful green tablecloth. And this service provides the opportunity for a consumer or a resident to bring in a plant specimen, a pest, a disease, ask a question. And our master gardeners are trained on how to research and diagnose those issues. So sometimes they'll know it right off the top of their head, other times they need to take a little bit of time and look into some <laughs> solutions for the people. Um, but they are present generally at the Outer Banks Arboretum or in our home office on Budley Street, or if we're out and about in the community, they will also provide that service. Um, another requirement for being a master gardener is to continue to build your scholarship and knowledge. So they are required to do a certain number of educational hours each year to keep their certification. And this year we connected them with 25 training opportunities where they could learn more about different pests or new plants or different types of diseases. In addition to all of that, they maintain an online video library with 18 videos in our um, YouTube portal. And this year they had over 5,600 views on those videos alone. We've also had the good fortune of working with Charlie Burroughs and his team. Um, and we have two videos broadcasting on current TV at the moment. And we really appreciate their expertise and technical assistance in polishing our education and really getting that out there. So we like that partnership as well. Another big project that the Master Gardeners continue to work on throughout the year is the Outer Banks Arboretum, which is a true gem and asset to the community. Um, this year they put on a native plant showcase there and then we've always sort of been curious about how much foot traffic goes through the Arboretum on a regular basis. 
So we were able to secure a little extra funding and put in the budget to install a visitor tracker there. And we just have this up and running. So we're looking forward to analyzing the data on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly and seasonal basis to see how many people visit that space. Um, and of course, we'll work towards drawing more people into that area as well. And then another big project that they work on that's housed at the um, Outer Banks Arboretum adjacent to the Bomb Center there is the Coastal Gardening Festival. Um, this generally is the whole festival, but last year for 2021, because of the COVID numbers, we decided to have it just be a coastal gardening plant sale. But what makes this unique is the opportunity for the public to acquire these plants that are grown entirely by the Extension Master Gardeners. So people can be rest assured that they're grown with quality care and that they have a pretty high chance of growing successfully in this coastal region. And they can range from house plants, succulents, herbs, vegetables, perennials, trees and shrubs. And last year for this event, they grew over 1600 plants and sold all but 50 of them. And the proceeds from this sale then go towards supporting the programs that the Extension Master Gardeners do here in the community. Another project they're working on at the Arboretum is installing a woodland pathway. They recognized an area that wasn't utilized very well and they cleared a lot of the brush and they've installed a nice mulch path. And now the Arboretum is accessible from two other points, which is really wonderful as well. And a service that Extension offers to the community is the soil test kits. And this last year we provided over 306 of them out to the community so people can have their soil analyzed based on what they're trying to grow and try to amend it so they have a success with their growing. Um, one of the trainings that was offered to them was a firescaping training. And this was taken by 12 of the master gardeners. It was a 12 week course developed by the extension of uh, University of Georgia extension. And it went through how to determine if your house is landscaped with a firewise landscape design. It also identified different types of firewise plants to utilize in a landscape. So we're excited to roll out this education um, in the fall and into the future. And we certainly will need the partnership of our local fire departments to be sure that we are sharing out the proper information. So we are excited about that opportunity. And I've also had the privilege to take and get sort of um, get a sort of continuing education credit um, for developing a therapeutic horticulture program in the county. Um, this is a personal passion of mine, but there was a program offered by the university and I was able to take that course and learn more about the benefits of therapeutic horticulture. So I've been partnering as well with the Monarch Beach Club and with the Exceptional Children's High School um, and Manio group. And we're looking for other organizations that may serve individuals with mental health issues, with um, physical disabilities, loss of a loved one. There are many things that horticulture can be utilized for in the therapeutic sense. So you may wonder, how do people really find out about what all we have going on? Well, our system allows us to track and count all the people that we connect with in various different ways. So we track our direct contacts and those are individuals that we are able to collect their demographic information from. We track and count our indirect contacts, our digital media contacts, which is YouTube or social media and website, and then our mass media contacts which include our print press, so the newspapers, our TV shows, and our radio programs. So you can see this last year, and this is just one program year, if you collectively put all that together, we have been in front of over 6.6 .6 million individuals, mainly in Dare County, and we're really excited about that. It's a big number, but of course, we're continually looking for ways that we can improve those numbers as well. And we're just thankful that we've been able to have the shared efforts of the Dare County PR team, the Facebook team, and Charlie Burroughs and his team have really worked well with us to help spread the word. And of course, I touched on this a little bit, but we love our volunteers. We could not achieve the work that we do without this amazing volunteer force. Um, this group is essential to helping plan and conduct programs and outreach in our community. They are the heart of the work we do. They are 
integral in us thriving in the community. They're connected, they're invested, they're dedicated, and they're a valuable asset. And you may wonder, well, how valuable can a group of volunteers be? Well, last year they tracked over 4,763 hours of time, which equals a cash value of $123,744, which I think is exceptional when we look at the value that these volunteers bring to our program. And if you frame that a little bit differently, if we were to add these individuals to our payroll, it would need to be to the tune of over $123,000. So we're so grateful and thankful for the work that they do and their, dedica their dedication to our program. We're also thankful for our partnerships and really proud of the work that we've done in building this network. It creates such a wonderful opportunity for us to enhance our reach and they keep us informed of our community needs. Um, and as I move through the slides, you'll be able to recognize this incredible base of partners that we have working alongside of us in the community. This of course is a living list. We're always looking for new ways to connect and reach out to people and wow. expand. And as these organizations help us grow our work in the community, um, we are just grateful for the opportunities for us to be able to work together. And since we've shared with you about all the things that we've done this last year, our focus this for this new year for the program is local, where we're focusing on local foods, plant and plants and people, and we've been able to put a spotlight on the richness of this unique area. So we are looking at local foods and how um, they're grown or processed and local plants. So we've done a lot of work on the native plants. And then we're focusing on local people where we're featuring in a local spotlight each month in our newsletter, different fishermen or farmers, artists and entrepreneurs that do a lot of work here and they have businesses locally. And if you look in your red folders, you'll see our spotlight newsletter articles that were written by our admin, administrative assistant, Kim Armstrong. She's wonderful at weaving a story. So when you have a minute, mm -hmm. read about some of these fantastic businesses that are in our community. And we just continue to look forward to building <coughs> that portfolio. And so as we close with you today, we just want to really thank you for your time and listening to what we all have going on over at Dare County Cooperative Extension. And we thank you greatly for the support that you provide us. We could not do our work without the team as, of local leaders and the support of the county that you all provide. It, we're really grateful for the work and the partnership that you provide us and the support. Um, and I do have just a real short video. It's kind of jazzy that it'll catch a little snippet of some of the highlights from this last year. So thank you. What? That's okay.
Appreciate your time. Are there any questions that you have for us? Anyone have any questions of Tanya? Just just a quick observation. Uh, the Buxton Methodist Church has been a couple, about two and a half years ago, but we had a major half a million dollar benefactor, and we were really scrambling to fill up the flower boxes, and somebody reached out to our cooperative extension, and they went with the native uh, plant in these brick, I mean, it's red, brown, blonde, and tan bricks, and the native plants, it's almost like American wiregrass. I can't think of the names of them, but it's really amazing. We get comments on them all the time. It's just, oh, the low maintenance native stuff. So you're doing Wonderful. good work. Great, thank you. I know it's a long way down there. It is, but that's, that's a great story to hear. That it's a long way impacts, anywhere we yeah. live in Hatters. Yeah. And, thank you. I'd just like to say congratulations to Dee. I've known Dee basically from the start, I believe, back <laughs> in the Ann Ward days. <laughs> it's great, it's good to see you. Well, it's great work that you ladies Thank do, you. and we really commend you for all the successes that you have and what you do in the county. Thank you. Really, Thank you. Really well, appreciate we appreciate it, and like I say, we couldn't do it without your help and support. So we're fortunate, Extension Office, to have the support we do from you. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Tanya. Have a good right. evening, gentlemen. Yes, Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for our time. Thank you. Thank you. County manager. That brings us to item four on the agenda, and Dorothy's going to give us an update on the website design. Take their pictures Dorothy's without me photo, in the background. Their, <laughs> our PIO is going to photobomb their picture. One up, Caitlin. Good evening, Dorothy. Good Caitlin. evening. I'm here with Caitlin Kite, our PR specialist, and. Um, we want to thank y'all for this opportunity to provide an overview of the redesign process for our county website. So the last redesign um, took place over six years ago. So this is something that was definitely needed. It was time for this update and a refresh. Um, this process started at the beginning of this year. And Caitlin has really taken the lead where we all have input, but she's appreciate the work that she's put in kind of moving things forward. Um, we're currently finalizing the graphic design phase and that's why we're here. We want you all to take a peek at what it's going to look like. And from there, we'll move to development, content migration, and then eventually, of course, launching the new site late this year. Um, from a communication standpoint, we know our website is often the first and the primary source of information for our citizens to access information about local government. And I think last month, Caitlin looked it up with close to 60,000 visits to our site last month. So we get a lot of visits. And in, in thinking about that, um, the question comes up, what are some of the most important features that our citizens expect? when they're accessing our site. And they expect a lot, you know, they, they're looking for many different things. We have lots of different services. So um, I think most important information delivery and task completion that's mobile friendly, responsive and accessible. And it also must be, the, there's a lot of information that needs to be well organized, content rich and highly searchable so they can find what they're, what they're looking for easily. Um, I mentioned the importance of being mobile friendly. Just so you know, well over half of the traffic to our site, are, they're using a mobile device. That's right. That's, that's increased a great deal, even over the last six months or so. That number just continues to climb. So it's important to make sure that it's mobile friendly so that it you can access that information um, on that smaller in that smaller window. So our goal um, through this process is to use a service-minded approach um, to improve the citizen experience when accessing our website and to ensure a professional and a beautiful website that we can all be proud of. So at this time, Caitlin's gonna walk y'all through the process and um, give you that sneak peek I talked about, and then we'll answer any questions that you have. So thank you for letting us be here. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay. It's Dorothy. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, so yes, yeah, so as Dorothy mentioned, it's been about six years since the last design of the website. 
So not saying we're overdue, but we're ready for a website redesign. There have been a lot of advances in capabilities and mobile responsiveness that we're going to take advantage of in this redesign, mm -hmm. making that information easier for people to find, um, especially you know, you'll see through, we're going to take you through the process that we've been through with Granicus, which is the company that hosts our website. They're handling the redesign and we're giving them all the feedback. They've done several studies. Um, so a lot of information backs up the changes that we're going to showcase. And we're going to take you through just a few of the studies that we've performed with Granicus. The first of which um, are web analytics, which we check weekly using our Google Analytics. This shows you how people are interacting with your website, what they're accessing most frequently, where their hangups may be, you know, looking at the bounce rate to see, okay, they got to this page and they were on here for a couple minutes and then they probably picked up the phone and called because they didn't go to the next step. Um, we're using analytics to ensure that we're better serving our residents, our property owners, and our visitors with this redesign. So just a few of the conclusions from our analytics. Um, 55.4% of traffic is generated by returning visitors. This is actually a really good number. 30% um, is kind of, you want to be above 30% for that to be a successful site. Um, of course, the nature of our website, people are returning to pay those bills, to access information, access meeting information. But that's a good number. Um, average ses session duration is 1 minute 55 seconds. A good average is between 2 to 3 minutes. So that is kind of what tells us, okay, did they get to the water department's page to pay their bill and they couldn't find the link to click to pay the bill online, so they picked up the phone and called. So just different areas that we think we can improve upon <laughs> based on that. Organic search yielded 67.36% of all traffic sources. This is a really good number. You want to be above 20%, so that means that our SEO on our website is good. We've got a lot of key contributors to the different pages on the websites, uh, on our website through various departments. Um, so they're updating information regularly, which means that those keywords are there. When someone performs a Google search, they're finding the information that they're looking for. Direct traffic yielded 21.46% of all traffic sources, and that is someone typing in DRNC.com directly and accessing the website. A few of our most popular pages you'll see, and I just pulled this today, so it changes regularly, but upcoming projects is really big right now because that's where they're accessing the information about essential housing. We just sent out a release last week about your meeting, so that one's really popular right now. Um, GIS is always very popular. Searching tax records, also a very popular page. COVID-19 response in Dare County is still up there in the numbers. Um, beach hazards, people are looking at which beaches have lifeguards, what hours they're patrolled, information like that, whether they can bring their dogs to the beaches. We've got all that on those pages. Re-entry information um, after a hurricane. We sent a release a couple of weeks ago, so there's still a lot of people accessing that information. And then staff directory, which stays pretty popular. It's usually within the top 10 on our pages. The next study that Granick has performed was the heat mapping study, which is really interesting. You'll see on the next slide. It's actually a visual rep representation of how our users are interacting with the pages. So it's um, sort of like a, a survey that you would see on the Oregon Inlet Bridge showing various steps. This shows um, exactly how many people are clicking on different areas of the page. So I'll just show you on the next slide here. You can see all the areas in orange and red are heavily concentrated clicks. The areas of blue are least concentrated clicks and green somewhere in between. So you can see that um, the top of the page, the four, or the third from the right at the very top of the page, that is our GIS. So people are accessing using that very top link. Next to that, the other red blob is Jobs. Jobs, um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm on there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're one of the red dots. <laughs> so, and then search. You can see at the very top of the page, a lot of people are searching as soon as they access the page to find what they're looking for. Under main navigation, departments and tax info are the two categories that receive the most engagement. So we know we want to keep those at the top of the page. The tax info within the submenu within the submenu of the tax info, the most clicked items are our GIS property search, which is also that very um, top left concentrated area that you see there, and then search by address and search by owner. 
In the spotlight, the section on the left, you can see is rarely clicked, so we know that this is wasted space. We can utilize that in a different way. Um, the quick link column on the top left, the fourth from the top, is that's where COVID information was located, so that's the area that people are clicking as well. Um, within news, the first article that we post, we can see receives quite a few clicks. Other than that, as we scroll down the page, people aren't interacting. They're not scrolling down to see those other news items. So we want to utilize the horizontal space on the page. And then the events and meetings, we have a toggle tab. So you can toggle back and forth right now between upcoming meetings and upcoming events. And people don't realize that they can toggle between those. So we're going to combine those together so that you just see whatever the most recent or the, most, um, the four upcoming events and meetings are. And then we also did a community survey. So the community survey, um, the link to it was posted on the homepage of our website. And then we also pushed it on social media. This was a survey that you may be asked to um, fill out when you use a website if you make a purchase. Similar questions, what were your interactions with the website? Did you find the information you're looking for? What were areas you thought could be improved upon? Um, and then we got some demographics from that as well to see who was interacting with the page. We got 384 responses and we needed 380 to That's make phenomenal to be. Yeah, it's really Granicus was actually pretty impressed with that um, because they struggled to get that statistical significance of 380 based on your population size. So we were really happy with that. And so you'll see the conclusions here. Um, it was interesting. Most of the respondents identified themselves as Dare County residents. That's 84%, which is great. That's we want to reach. Um, the majority of the respondents are actually 55 and older, with the older con the majority of that concentration being 65 and up. Most respondents visit the website a few times a month. That was 28%. Um, and then the top reasons for visiting the website, we had reasons such as news, um, ge geographical information system, paying their water bill, attaining a permit, employment, library programs, hurricanes, COVID update. COVID-19 updates, um, and that the largest segment of our respondents actually felt that navigating the site was easy. That was 44%, and then neither easy nor difficult at 41%. Most of the respondents felt satisfied with the organization of information, so we know we don't want to disrupt that too much. We want people who are familiar with using the site to still find what they're looking for um, and just make it a little easier for everyone else as well. Respondents suggested that more apparent department buttons would be more helpful, and then also better search results <laughs> and improvements to the navigation, which we took into consideration. And then other, and other suggestions were more detailed content about services, having the most important content at the front of the page, makes sense, fewer words, clearly marked buttons for paying bills, a shorter drop-down menu, and then reducing the homepage clutter and fewer clicks. The, uh, Caitlin, the other uh, the other button, the green on the, uh, is, would you characterize that mostly as like maybe uh, out of area property owners or who, who, yes. who are some of the people that make up that other? That's so 12%. Anyone who is accessing our website would have had, had access to complete the survey. So if they selected other, that's probably our visiting population. Um, second homeowners, we do have I own property in Dare County. So okay. I believe that green, Sorry, missed it. All right. that bottom bar would be, yep. Got it. And then we had a large concentration who also works in Dare County. So that's good too to see. So this is kind of showing you guys where we're at in the process. You can see we've still got a ways to go. We've been, it's been about um, almost five months that we've been working on this to kind of getting the wireframe together what we're going to present to you guys as far as the graphic design is the fourth revision that we've had. And we feel really good about it, so we're excited to share it with you. But we do have a little ways ahead of us because it's going to be a lot of content migration because we've got a big, robust website. So this is our website now. And you can see, I just kind of wanted you to be able to see it and compare it to the next slide that I'm going to show you. This is what we're looking at um, as far as as soon as you type in darency.com, this is what you're going to find. So you can see that um, we have content buttons at the bottom, which is a little bit zoomed in here in this view. But you can kind of see um, all of the departments or quick links that we had on the left side of the page. We can now have horizontally across utilizing that space. and We can actually have 15 of those. 
Um, at the top of the page, you'll see we have the search bar, still the kind of the same navigational flow as far as our county instead of about government departments and services. And this hero image that you see here, we, we like to use it to represent our area with beautiful pictures. We have some <coughs> great photography that we can use. The little overlay, the sort of translucent overlay that you see at the top that says on the horizon, that can be turned on and off. So we can have it you know, off as soon as you access the page and it's gonna flip through, rotating through several images. And we can also use that as a call out for whatever information we'd like to highlight. Like right now we have our service pins and our pet of the week and all of that sort of content. So that's how that can be utilized. And then just to give you a zoomed out view, this is the page kind of split in half. So this is DarrenC.com homepage. And you can see that we have the news section is now horizontal. That's gonna be um, just after a really cool new feature, which we're gonna show you guys called Find a Service. Um, but you can have nine news stories and then they can also click to view more. There's a nice image associated with each news story that makes you wanna read and, and find out what's going on in that article. And then we have our calendar, which showcases 12 upcoming events or meetings. And you can scroll through those as well, click them to find more information. And then we have a video section. We've got a lot of great video content. Deer County Extension just talked about a few of the videos that Charlie had produced for them. So our videos, we really want to be able to highlight on our homepage of our website as well so that folks are seeing those. And when you click one of those videos, it doesn't actually take you to another site. It just kind of shadow overlays the website. So you can watch it without leaving the site, and which also isn't great for our rate. You want people to stay on the website where they're finding more information. And then at the bottom, we have all of our social links again and another um, way to sign up for our email delivery services when you type in your email address there and the same content, content information. And so here, this is the feature that we really wanted to highlight with you guys. Um, it's called Find a Service. So this is just kind of auto-populated. We would be able to customize this. We will be customizing this, um, but you can use this service to pay a bill, to apply for a permit, to find an agenda. We can use those action items that we found in all the surveys that we've done and all the studies that we've done. What's, what is the information that people are trying to access and let's make it as easy as possible using this feature. So as soon as you type in, as soon as you select from the first category, say pay, the next category will auto populate with a list of options. You click that and then it takes you directly to the link on that page where you can pay the bill, where you can access the permit or what the form, whichever it is. So that's a great new feature. And then you can see on the next page, um, what we wanted to showcase here on this slide is the fact that the drop down screen will be alphabetized. And then on the other page, you can see the very top bar there actually becomes a sticky bar. So where you have Deer County and then all of our main navigational items such as um, you know, about our, our county and government, it's tiny for me to see, <laughs> government departments, um, and then the little search icon. As you scroll down the page, that stays on the top of your page with this design. So you can easily search. If you're scrolling down the page and you haven't found something that you're looking for, that little hourglass, the little um, magnifying glass, in order to search the page pops up there and you can easily do a search without having to scroll back to the top of the screen. Can we go and, back one, Caitlin? Oh, sure. This is all in process, yes? Yes. I was just looking under government, the city council, <laughs> yes. the city manager. It's it's all what Granick is populated. Impressive. <laughs> I was I was looking at that today and I thought, gosh, I really wish we could have changed that. Nobody's gonna <laughs> nobody's gonna catch that. <laughs> it's really good. It's, these are really it's really good stuff. <laughs> well good. And, and just to follow up on it on a serious note, I was just kidding. I knew that was just kind of populating. Typically, in my experience, when doing something like this, either a website or whatever, there are sort of those out there in the universe that are recognized as sort of best in class sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And we would steal shamelessly from them, whatever ideas. <laughs> I mean, we would, unapologetically. Yeah. Mary Helen, that's a fabulous idea. We're going to use that in our county. Do, do we have, are there like... And I don't know the answer to this website designs that, wow, that one just knocks your socks off. 
let's steal their ideas and replicate it for Dare County's template of departments or services. That's kind of what we did. <laughs> <laughs> we did. That Continue. That's what I was, we went through. I was impressed um, with everything I'm seeing, and I thought, I wonder if they've done that. Okay. <laughs> we stole a lot of ideas. <laughs> we borrowed a lot of ideas there and made go. them our own. But we did look through. So we looked on our own just as a PR department at countless websites just to see what we liked. And we took screenshots. And I still have the bookmark of about 50 different websites with different notes <laughs> that we appreciated. Good. And then we also, Granicus actually then said, okay, here are all of our customers. Here's a list of them. And we kind of have an idea of what you're looking for. Check these out. And we actually made comments on each of those websites. Okay, we like this. We like this, but we like it in a different color or a different placement. And they took all of that into consideration and, and built this. So Yes, that was my thought too. <laughs> Definitely, no need to recreate Good. the wheel if someone is doing it very well. Right. Thanks, Kate. Yes. Hey, when we were reviewing this before, we talked about the possibility of doing a, a border so that the white didn't fade into the white. Yes. Are we still looking at doing that? It's there. Uh, it, you may not be able to yet. see it. Yeah. Can you see? It's a. Um, whenever that flips back, it's. You can see it's a thin dark border at the top. Yeah, right at the top of the page on that left bar. Okay. So the, the right side is just showing you a continuation of the page as you scroll down, but that, that left bar, it's kind of cut off here on my slide. I may have made it a bit too bad, a bit too big, but it's the um, same teal color that are the font um, on each of those bubbles. Okay. And it's, um, I forget the weight of it. I think it's maybe three points the way to cross the top, but it does give you that separation from if you've got a busy Great. browser with bookmarks. And then just to show you guys also, these are examples of sub pages. So um, each sub page that we have, each departmental page will be transferred over to this format, which is really nice as far as highlighting. You can see the example here are parks and facilities. And then on the right, if they don't have basketball. a lot of content, it just basketball. still looks clean easy to access. The, the slide that you see, the picture on the left side of the screen, the red bar at the top is what our emergency notice will look like. It will be across every single page. So if we have um, a tropical storm warning or watch, whatever that information is, that will be on the, as a red bar on the top of each page with a link to access more information. And that is it. I'm happy to answer any questions or Good go job. back through any of the slides if you guys would like to excellent job yeah man exciting yeah, real good yeah. job i think it's going to be really nice we're, we're going big time yeah, here commissioners <laughs> we're we're going to set a trend thank you Caitlin. <laughs> thank you yeah Kate. good stuff yeah thank yes. you all very much thank you for your hard work yeah bc thank you thank you for your feedback and i'm excited to show you the finished site i think it's going to be nice great thanks thank you, <clears throat> Jim, that brings us to item five. Uh, this is an E911 budget amendment. This is just a matter that E911 board has allocated us about $169,000, and there's a budget minute to put it into the budget. And there's also an expenditure line. You'll see this. It's been allocated for expenses for the E911 center, and you all need to approve that budget amendment. Okay, pleasure of the board. Move to approve. Motion on full by Commissioner House Second. to approve the amendment. Seconded by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Um, item six is um, we, we're at a point where we need to choose the construction manager at risk for our Masonic Lodge project and our EMS projects. Uh, the Capital Improvement Committee met and reviewed all of those uh, app, the submissions that we got. I think there were six of them, I believe, um, or five of them. Um, they whittled it down to three that we dealt with fairly often Whitey Turner, Barnhill, and Oakley Collier. And after much discussion and going through those, they uh, recommend to you all that we move forward with Barnhill. Our experience with them over at COA has been excellent. Um, not to say that Whiting Turner wasn't when we dealt with them, uh, but uh, that was the choice of the CIP. You all have seen all of the applications, and so it's at a place, it's before you now to, to make that selection. 
Right. Thank you, County Manager. The pleasure of the board. Move Moved to approve uh, Barnhill Contracting <coughs> Company as construction manager at risk for both EMS and Sonic Lodge construction projects and approve the county manager to negotiate and sign the contract. Thank you, Vice Chairman Overman, for that motion. Seconded by Second. Commissioner Couch. Ross and Couch. Couch. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Chairman, items seven and eight are essentially the same thing. One's for Hatteras Inlet, one's for Oregon Inlet, but they're the resolutions that we've done a bunch of them. Every time we have to do the matching fund in the uh, shallow draft inlet fund, we have to do one of those resolutions. And so this is for your approval for those two resolutions so we can get the state match funds for those two inlet projects. And I need motions to approve both of those. Motion to uh, adopt a resolution, approve the uh, amendment, and uh, authorize the county manager to contract. Am I gotten ahead of myself? I've gotten ahead of myself, haven't I? No. 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 You're right. Bob, is that correct, Bobby? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. That's my motion. Second. It's a motion on the floor by Commissioner Couch. It's been seconded by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like Senate. Motion carries unanimous. Um, item nine, you heard from the tourism board some time ago about the boardwalk project that they had to <laughs> ask us would we be willing to participate in that. We said that we would. Uh, this is their grant application, and there's a resolution in there that's similar that uh, they're trying to get state funds, and, and we're doing a similar resolution to, for the matching funds. Those matching funds will be provided by the tourism board, not by us, but we're the pass through for those funds. Right. So we need a motion to adopt those res that resolution as well. Okay, thank you, County Manager. Move to approve. There's a motion on the floor by the Vice Chairman to approve to adopt the resolution to sponsor the Soundside Boardwalk Improvement Project. So, second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Tobin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those like sign. Motion carries unanimous. And then the last of those is the Island H modification grant. Once again, we're asking for the state matching funds to do the modifications to Island H to hold spoil, and uh, we need to have that resolution approved as well. Motion to approve. There's a motion on the floor by Commissioner House to approve. It's been seconded by. <clears throat> I'll second it. <laughs> Commissioner Tobin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. And just while he's here, I want to thank Barton for yeah. bird dogging these. He's done a lot of work to get <laughs> yes. it. Thank you, Barton. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. taken him two months to do. So thanks for your hard work there, Barton. You bet. Um, item 11 is the consent agenda. On the consent agenda, you have the approval of the minutes. You have reimbursement resolutions for fiscal year 2022-23 vehicle and equipment financing and 2022-23 public works equipment financing. Uh, you have uh, a capital outlay budget amendment for the sanitation fund, <coughs> the tax collection report, the Tyler payment card processing agreement, a budget amendment for deeds of trust for the special revenue fund, fiscal year 23 capital project ordinance for the public works equipment amendment, Fiscal year 23 to opiate settlement funds, budget amendment, uh, the budget amendment for our leases, and then the Conkin Road R5014 utility pre preliminary engineering agreement. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. There's Commissioner Tobin's move. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner House. Any further discussions? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Um, next are your budget, I mean your budget, your board appointments. Uh, the first is the Pheasant and Center Advisory Board. Uh, the board recommends Jennifer Cromwell for the appointment of their at-large vacancy. Move to appoint Cromwell, please. Okay, there's a motion on the floor by Commissioner Couch to Same. approve. It's been seconded by the Vice Chairman. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. And then you have upcoming board and committee appointments. In July, you have the Airport Authority with two terms expiring, the East Lake Community Center Board with two terms expiring, the Game and Wildlife Commission with three terms expiring, the Library Board, the East Albemarle Region, one term expiring, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Council, one term expiring, and the Juan Cheese Community Center Board with two terms expiring. 
In August, you have the ABC board with one term expiring, the airport authority with one term expiring, the Parks and Rec Advisory Council with one term expiring, the Stumpy Point Community Center board with four terms expiring, and the Virginia S. Tillett Community Center Advisory Board with four terms expiring. And finally, in September, you have the Health and Human Services Board with four, four terms expiring, and the Nursing Home Community Advisory Council with one term expiring. So that, Mr. Chairman, would be your agenda. All right. Thank you, County Manager. That brings us to item tw uh, 13, excuse me, uh, and that's County Manager's business and, and uh, Commissioner's business. Uh, Commissioner Couch, do you mind kicking that off this evening? Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, not a lot to report. Full swing, uh, busy, busy, busy time down there. Uh, uh, I will say that uh, trying to be as active as I can uh, with the beach nourishment project, as everybody knows, there's two projects going on down there. Uh, things are going nice. We're early into it. Uh, Bobby and a handful of commissioners will be down there tomorrow. I think you're going to be impressed with what you see. Uh, the community uh, has embraced these guys, and I say that. I touched a little bit on the last meeting about finding them housing. Uh, you know, it gets expensive when you're wanting a motel room for a week, but there's been a couple of people that have uh, got it down to in the $60 and $70 a night range, which is phenomenal, and they're deeply appreciative. As a matter of fact, uh, at Great Lakes, uh, some of the very upper management will be down uh, as we get a little further into July. So very excited. Uh, they're moving. It's, it's a gorgeous project, gorgeous product as well. As soon as the uh, water leaches out, you can't even tell. It, it's as if it's just an extension of the beach, same color. And that's all I got. Great news. Thank you, Commissioner. Couch. Could I ask Commissioner Couch? Yes, sir. Uh, I understand there's a, quite an event coming up on the 29th of the month, the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum. Yes, sir, Commissioner Ross. That's uh, it's private. Uh, uh, we're trying to keep uh, the, the we just in it, been inundated with the public, but uh, of course the commissioners are involved. Uh, a lot of the uh, science community here, Coastal Sciences, the Tourism Board and everything, just trying to give uh, uh, the people who have supported the project and uh, in the community access to the people that are designing the Got exhibits. It. And it, it's going to be worth the drive. I'd like to encourage everybody to come down. I know we're all busy, but uh, we'll make it worth your while. Five o'clock, uh, Wednesday the 29th. Uh, state folks will be there, exhibit designers, some uh, submarine specialists, some really impressive things. It's an impressive exhibit. Thank you, um, Commissioner Couch. Um, Commissioner uh, Tobin? Yeah, I have a couple things. Um, I'll just give you a quick update on the dredge. Um, it's looking like probably mid-July delivery date, which delivery date is... Someone, in, write, in, someone write this down. I'm going <laughs> to write it in write it, yeah, write, 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 Jim said, <laughs> right. Jim said, you heard it. Right so it's the delivery date is in Morgan <laughs> City, Louisiana, and it'll take at least two weeks to get it up here. But if they're moving along really good now that they got those those circuit breakers and stuff, so super, it's getting to be a little bit firmer on their dates. Yeah, the pictures really look good. Oh, uh, and the other thing, uh, Barton left, but another thing, hats off to Barton. Um, you know, at our last meeting, I asked or let you know that we were giving some more money to Ken Wilson and his firm to do some of that permitting for the new section of, that we're going to dredge. And they had a, uh, uh, meeting with Heather Coates from DCM last Wednesday, Jeremy and Todd from the core were on it. And, um, the, the, the main concern DCM had was how the Snell operated and what it's drag heads were like <laughs> and what have you. And they assured them that the, the, the setup of the drag heads are the same as they are on the merit and and of the Merton. So they said that they were sure that they could either, they weren't sure if they were going to grant us a, a temporary relief or uh, do a modification. But um, either way, they were pretty sure that it was going to be done in time. That they assured us actually that it was going to be done in time to get the Snell in. So that's really, really, really good news. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's all I've got. Thank you, Commissioner Tobin. Appreciate all your hard work on that. And that, that is good news about the dread. Yeah, and thanks, yeah. thanks to the board for yeah. su supporting that. Yeah. It's a big, Absolutely. big thing. <clears throat> Commissioner Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've just got two uh, quick updates. 
one last week on the 16th. Uh, we had quite a bit of discussion tonight about availability of healthcare services, which is obviously a concern for all of us. But we had a groundbreaking event where dirt was moved, people were on the scene, and the new cancer treatment center, the new building construction will begin and groundbreaking took place on the 16th of June. And that will be in conjunction with the current existing radiation therapy building directly across the street from the Outer Banks Hospital. So what we will have is state-of-the-art equipment, oncologists, facilities with the appropriate amenities for those being treated and their caregivers uh, centrally located there in, in the Nags Head uh, Hospital community. So I was very pleased, uh, very grateful to be a participant and, and uh, attendee. And that, I think, is exciting news. It will be open. Target is September of next year, so roughly 14 months for completion. And number two, looking at Commissioner or Bateman and I, uh, we spent some time following up the primary election and the process of the primary election and how that might be improved. And I just wanted to call out her, both Jackie Tillett and Kelly McPherson for their outstanding efforts in analyzing and diagnosing where steps for improvement could take place. They were kind enough to take the time to meet with Commissioner Bateman and I. Uh, we reviewed a number of steps, and uh, I think we will have some improvements before the general election in our processes, and uh, I'm just excited about those improvements because we hit a few snags, but I'm very, very confident and very grateful to Jackie and Kelly for their efforts in this regard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Commissioner House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a lot, but I, I did I did want to put out one thing to the general public uh, is that please be careful when you're on the roads. I have seen a tremendous amount of careless driving so far this year above even what I've seen in past years. The near misses are The near terrifying. misses are terrifying. Yep. Um, just yesterday, uh, or actually day before yesterday, I'm driving down the bypass, heading south. There is a car in front of me in the right-hand lane and immediately takes a left-hand turn to go down a side street. They crossed right in front of me and I locked my truck down. Yeah and barely missed them. And two cars on the other side had to do the same thing. So please, everyone, be ex extremely diligent when you're out on the roads. Um, like I said, I've seen uh, quite a few near misses, even more so this year than I have in years past, even in the short time that we've had the tourist year. So please be diligent. Um, our day in history, very important day. 1782, Congress approved the great seal of the United States of America with the bald eagle as a symbol. And uh, one of our uh, most favorite parts of our commissioners' uh, meetings, meet our pet of the week, Grace. Our pet of the week for this week is Grace. This <laughs> sweet girl is about two years old. She is very smart, gentle, and loves to give hugs. Grace gets the best zoomies and has such a fun personality. She is house trained and ready to find her forever home. If you have another dog and are interested in adopting Grace, please come by the shelter for a dog meet. To adopt Grace or foster one of our other animals, you can come visit us Monday through Saturday at our shelter located in Mania. This week, join us at the Dowdy Park Farmer's Market, June 23rd from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Come do some shopping with the local vendors of the Outer Banks and meet some of our adoptable pets. For more information, visit our website at www.obxspca.org or visit our OBX SPCA Facebook page. That's a nice looking day. That's a nice looking day. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, Grace <laughs> looks beautiful as, as the county of Dare. <laughs> um, I'm hoping the video actually goes out on the, on the, on the telecast. Mm -hmm. um, but Grace is a, is a wonderful uh dog and she's looking for a good home so uh let's get let's give grace a forever home and thank you mr chairman thank you commissioner house <clears throat> vice chairman over
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd uh, just like to say one thing. Uh, congratulations again to Dennis Carroll as our uh, Dare County Citizen of the Year. Yeah, I tell you, they, they don't make many folks like him, and we're fortunate to have one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Vice Chairman. Commissioner Bay? Yeah. Um, I can identify with these folks so we, and we're talking as, as we all can. Get, we, get, get, grace. Grace, get Grace. Get Grace. Grace coming back. As, as we all can identify with them. Um, I remember if you riding right off the bridge coming on to Dare County on, from Cray Tuck, get that first right is known as the Woods Road. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, when I was a little kid, it was like a gigantic tunnel. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all remember coming down for the first time, whatever. You go through that Woods Road, and even on a hot summer, sunny day, you could not see the sun. It was so overgrown. Uh, 1990, um, at the time, Mike Beecham, a really good friend of mine, dad owned out of his contractors. They went through there, and they paved that road. It was and a fight, they, I remember. Mm -hmm. They cut trees down on both sides yep. all of a sudden it opened it up and I, I just basically just devastated me because that was my my home and it really upset me that was progress and so i identified with these folks that um about the property they have beside them and the development going in unfortunately it's, it's what happens um when other people come down here and i want to make this place our home now there's homes on the woods road mm -hmm. there's um development we do have a bike path down there now it's a very pleasant ride on a bike or a run or so forth but it's changed dramatically from what it was so i can identify with them and, and i have um I, I understand malcolm you've got much more patience um and i like the way that you said about not blasting anybody but i want some answers y'all i mean just it really upsets me that letter if you read the letter that went out because one of my customers came over it was callous it was you could tell it was strictly about business it didn't take people's lives in consideration when whoever wrote the letter i personally think they need to fire them because it wasn't very nice and so i would like someone from that group to come to their county and address with us or with the town of manio or somebody saying this is what we're going to do. This is how the problem is going to be solved in a timely fashion. And nobody's addressed that the little thing they put on the voice. And I'm sorry to come out and say this, but it was a bunch of caca. It identified the problem. It didn't identify what the action was going to be taken. And their solution was go elsewhere. I know. I, that's it. And, <laughs> and, and the other thing is, and I was, yeah. listen, I was told by someone within the system, that the people that got the letter who had had this physicians for years, they were discarded. But the people who had been here like six months and just moved in and got the physician there, they're still going there and having a physician. But the folks that had been seeing <coughs> Dr. Billy Bob. I'm sorry, Herb. repeat that again, please. The what? folks that had a track record for many, many years. That were there. 32 years for me. Yeah. At the Manteo facility. At the Manteo facility. 32 years for And me. they were told go to Moyo. Go somewhere else. City. Yep. But, go somewhere else. But someone else within six months, yep. there are no doctors there. So what where do, where are they there, going? there are doctors there. They have the position. There are doctors. There. Yeah. Oh. And they get to stay there. And so those people have to go to Edenton. Dorothy, you have a comment? No, I'm sorry. Edenton, Hertford, Elizabeth City, somewhere else. So, and I hope I'm not by myself and I'm not trying to grandstand, but it just pisses the hell out of me. I personally think that Malcolm's got a pretty good idea. I do too. We need, we need to band with the town get, and bring some people down here and get some explanations and try to figure out a solution. Uh, let me let me jump on board with this. Uh, I reached out to a couple of medical professionals uh, down there and uh, actually more than a couple. And uh, this is a countywide, this can be a countywide effort. Uh, so it's from Duck uh, to the beach, Roanoke Island, Hatteras Island. Uh, we can be unified on this. I'm done. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Um, county manager, it comes to county manager. I'm going to go to um, um, our public information officer first because I know you've got a couple of things and you want to close session. 
So I'll ask our public information officer if she has anything else for us this evening. I don't, no, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. <coughs> Sally, you sat over there very patiently <laughs> and quiet all evening. Our assistant finance director, do you have anything for us this evening? No, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you. Nice having you here, Sally. Amen. That's right. <laughs> Uh, it was quite a good meeting. <laughs> <laughs> County manager. Yes, sir. I have one thing before I ask for a closed session. Um, some weeks ago, we talked about uh, NC Works coming in and using that little small office down yeah. in our lobby area. Right. Um, they have now moved their stuff in there, um, and we're at a point, and we finally got the terms of the lease settled between us. You all, we need to publish that. Do we need to publish that, or can we go forward with it as it is, Dustin? Go forward. So, I'll be entering that lease. Um, it's at least for one year. And so you all, how's it work? You all don't have to approve it, but you have to give me the authority to do it. It's a silly statute, but leases of less than one year, you have to give me authority to do that. So if you will do that, then I'll sign the lease and get them rolling in that site. Motion to give me authority. Okay. <laughs> second. Yep, second. We've had to do this before. There's a motion on the floor then by Commissioner House. It's been seconded by the Vice Chairman and Com Commissioner Couch. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor saying five saying aye. 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 Opposed like said. Motion carries you now. Just the, the rent in there is nominal. It's such a small space, but it's more to provide a service to the community than anything yeah. else. So, okay. Uh, next, I need a close session. Before you go into that, sure. County Manager, I need to make the, this public and this clear, and I think the board uh, certainly should be aware, of, uh, uh, is already aware of this. Uh, with respect to the issue in Manio and health, uh, and Malcolm, uh, once again, thank you for your comments. Um, uh, I appreciate you uh, public comment and your suggestions and your comments. Um, this is not unique to many. We're having this kind of problems all over the country. Uh, but that certainly doesn't help our situation here. When I first learned about this, it's probably been two weeks ago now. As uh, soon as that letter hit, I called Ronnie Sloan at the hospital. I think you all are very much aware of that. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want the representatives from Greenville to be here. Yep. He asked me uh, as a courtesy at the time uh, not to do that, that, that he and his board were working diligently to try to correct uh, some of the problems here in Manio and, and the issues that were taking place. Um, it's public knowledge that that board has uh, stepped up to the plate with money to expand that facility. It's a misnomer that that facility is being shut down. That is not the case. At least that's what I've been told. I've been assured the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, this board, there's not a, I say this with all, in all due respect to prior boards, no board's worked any harder than this board. Anytime we've been approached by any issue whatsoever with this magnitude, we have stepped up to the plate. And we're doing every single thing that we humanly possibly can, and the public needs to be aware of that. And, and Commissioner Bateman, I understand your frustration, but... Um, uh, we are, we are, and yes, you as well, we're working as hard as we can with the, with the board to give them the benefit of the doubt to find out what the heck we can do to resolve this situation. I don't like it one bit either, but, um, the public needs to be aware that, that at least I have had multiple, multiple conversations with Ronnie Sloan multiple conversations with board members and i've tried to share every bit of that with you to let you know that and i gave ronnie that due respect now i couldn't agree more it's time to you know what or, or pack and go home but we need some answers and tomorrow morning i will make that call and i will demand that we have some representation here i will call a special meeting because we don't meet again until July. I will call a special meeting and I will I will 
demand that they give us a date sooner rather than later to get some answers. And I want the public to be aware of that. So it hadn't been because we've been sitting on our butt that uh, we haven't done anything about the situation. And I wanted to make that clear. Bobby, you might have Bobby mentioned uh, last week uh, when we were in Raleigh, uh, there was some That's right. discussions. Yeah, that, I didn't that, make that, that trip, but uh, the, the vice chairman and uh, Commissioner Tobin and, 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 and uh, county manager had the same conversations with our leadership. Yep. So, Bobby, you can yep. elaborate on that if you will. Well, yeah, we did. Um, we got some information from them. We, we also went to our lobbying firm, and, and the following day they collected some information. I shared that with you. There's some areas to talk about how to recruit um, doctors to an area. There's people that can help you do that. They gave us some of those names to do that. I told Malcolm that we would work with he and his group to accomplish that. It has to be a community process to make all that work, and so we've got some avenues we can go down in addition to the ones you just described. So we, we're aware and have been on it for since it came out. This, this is what I don't understand. I understand they want to expand that facility and change it into an urgent care facility and have you know care physicians there. Why did they throw out 3,000 of their patients and not say, look, we can take care of you over here and we, we're going to, it's going to be inconvenient for a while, but we're going to service your needs. I mean, I can't get my prescriptions filled. I mean, you know, you just don't throw out in our communities, an elderly community. Right. No, I couldn't, I, I mean, I couldn't agree. Just, <laughs> which justifies the special yeah. meeting is going to call yeah. Yeah. Right. your yeah. agent. Points are well taken. And Bob, let me clarify something. I was not being critical of this board. No, I know. I was not being critical of you or anybody else. What I was being critical of is a lack of communication between Biden and the grandmamas of the world and the mamas and so forth who have not got a prescriber to do their prescriptions and so forth, having to drive to Edenton to Hertford, and nobody's told them what the future holds for them. That's all I'm asking. No, Somebody say, yeah. listen. This is where we are. I couldn't agree, and it's unacceptable. And so I will make that call in the morning. I will demand as, as, as soon as humanly possible um, that we, we get somebody here with some answers. And we should invite some of the Manio commissioners Absolutely. to that meeting. Absolutely. Happy to do that. So, county manager. All right, Mr. Chairman, we need a closed session pursuant to NCGS 143-318-A3 to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the county or to preserve the attorney-client privilege. And we also need uh, a closed session pursuant to NCGS 143-318-11-A6 to review the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment or conditions of initial appointment of an individual public officer or employee or, or prospective public officer or employee. Is there a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Second. Commissioner Tobin, seconded by Commissioner House. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like, sign. Motion carries. <laughs>